for you as the, the moving around happens. So we, we we're hoping that it will all move very seamlessly today. So um, as Neve mentioned as well, we're right bang in the middle of Space Week. Um, um, Space Week is, takes place from the second, from the fourth to the tenth of October every year. Um, uh, the best place to go to find out about everything happening in Space Week is uh, spaceweek.ie, and you can find out about loads of events happening all right around the country. Of course, everything is virtual this year. Um, and I really want to thank my colleagues in Black Rock Castle Observatory for all their event in putting this, uh, for all their efforts in putting this event together this morning, uh, but also for coordinating Space Week nationally. It's, it's a big undertaking and they do a fantastic job every year. So, so the message from this slide, I guess, is make sure that you log on to the spaceweek.ie website. Okay, just in terms of today's event, this is just a quick graphic on what's happening. As you see, there's a, a YouTube channel and that's where all the speakers present. And as I said, uh, anyone can join into that. And then on Zoom, we have a number of breakout rooms um, and then we have quizzes and videos been, built into the, to the day as well. Um, so that's really all I got to say about that. We're, we, uh, we're underway now and we hope to be finished by um, about 12.30 when we get the evaluation and the telescope, cho uh, all um, the telescope prizes given out. Okay. I do want to share a little bit, a little bit about um, Azero Ireland. So Azero is a, a network of really their ESA education offices across Europe. There are currently 16 Azeros. Um, they are a partnership or a contract between the ESA Education mm -hmm. Office and an organization in each of the host countries. In Ireland, that contract or partnership is between European Space Agency Education and Science Foundation, which is where I work. Um, and really all the Azeros do very similar things. We promote STEM. Uh, we do uh, teacher CPD, we run events like this, all to promote science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering and maths, but particularly uh, with a space context. And as I said, all the Azeros do very similar things, but slightly different. And that's so that we can take ESA resources um, or classroom resources or events or projects, and we adapt them to make them fit better with our own countries. So that's, um, that's uh, Azero. Uh, I'm the, the manager of the European Space Education Resource Office in Ireland. Um, and it's my pleasure to uh, host events like this with colleagues like the, the team in Blackrock Castle Observatory. In terms of today's speakers, I'm delighted to welcome all of them. Our MC today is Neve Shaw. Uh, you've met her already. Neve is a performer, writer and communicator. She has only two degrees in engineering and a PhD in science. She's passionate about igniting people's curiosity. She explores the crossovers in STEM, art and communications to share the human story of science. And for anyone looking for a nice Christmas present, Neve has just published her book Dream Big, an Irish woman's space odyssey, and that's being launched tonight. And maybe she'll tell you a bit more about that later, but she is a bit shy about it, but I think it is worth mentioning. We're also delighted to welcome James Carpenter. James is a scientist at ESA, and James works at the Human and Robotic Exploration Directorate at ESA. He brings together a diverse set of scientific disciplines to perform scientific investigations at the moon and beyond. Um, and this science that he's working on will prepare the way for the future of humankind in space and, in, and it will investigate some fundamental questions about our place in the universe. So we really look forward to hearing more about that um, from James shortly. Hannah, is, uh, Hannah Kurvan is a space reliability engineer at Inalabs. She's involved in the development of new space products. products and she invests the system's probability to success or fail in a space environment. Of course, we want them all to succeed. Once they go up into space, we do, don't like leaving things to chance. It's a bit late if they're going to fail up there. And then, of course, we have Niall Smith from CIT Blackrock Castle Observatory. 
Niall studied astrophysics at University College Dublin and graduated with his PhD in 1990. So he's a very old man and much older than all the rest of us. He lectured in the, develop, in the Department of Applied Physics and Instrumentation in CIT in Cork Institute of Technology for 18 years um, and became the Institute's first head of research in 2005. And that's his current role. And of course, he is a founder and director of Black Rock Castle Observatory. So there are speakers today. Um, I really think we have a really, really um, great lineup of speakers. I hope you're all going to be uh, interested and engaged. Um, and I, I can't wait to get today going and hear what these people have got to share with us about their STEM education and their careers to date. So the final thing I wanted to do, if you don't mind, is to share just a little about a European Space Agency, because I think everybody knows about NASA, but I think less people know as, as much about the European Space Agency, ESA, and Ireland is a member of the European Space Agency. We contribute um, financially towards the European Space Agency, and it does absolutely amazing work. Um, I'm going to share this little video with you now, uh, which probably explains ESA much better than I can. This is the European Space Agency, dedicated to the peaceful exploration and use of space for the benefit of humankind. Established in 1975, we work together with our 22 member states to push the frontiers of science and technology and promote economic growth in Europe. We have offices in eight locations across Europe and one at Europe's spaceport in French Guiana where we provide independent access to space for scientific and commercial missions. Exploring space is humankind's greatest adventure and one that we have been involved with for more than 40 years. ESA has the technology and expertise to keep Europe at the heart of the new age of space exploration. From low Earth orbit, we are working to bring humans back to the moon and then onto Mars. By expanding the frontiers of knowledge, we are helping to answer the big questions about the universe. Space provides us with incredible opportunities to experiment and discover, yielding amazing new science. From Earth's neighbors to new worlds, we study stars, galaxies, and look for exoplanets. In addition to astronomy, planetary science, and astrophysics, ESA scientists work on growing food in space, searching for life on Mars, and understanding our own planet. From space, satellites are watching over Earth to monitor its health. Our satellites improve weather forecasts, observe the long-term effects of climate change, and contribute valuable knowledge to Earth science. The Sentinel satellites for the European Copernicus program provide vital information on our environment that can help improve our daily lives. Satellites also help you find where you are and get you where you want to go. We have developed Galileo, Europe's own global satellite system for navigating the globe. With over 20 satellites and a network of ground stations, Galileo provides precise global positioning information. Satellites are also connecting the world, making possible many of the technologies we use every day, like satellite TV and internet access. ESA is at the heart of Europe's satellite communications, developing new telecommunication systems and nurturing European innovation, bringing industry, science, and space technology together. In order to achieve all this, we need pioneering technologies that push the boundaries of the possible. ESA's world-class laboratories turn science into innovation, developing hardware and software for use in space and on the ground. Space technology gets rigorously tested to ensure it can withstand the harsh environment of space and the journey to get there. Traveling to space reliably is at the heart of ESA's vision for space transportation. We launch rockets that carry satellites into orbit and are constantly improving the design of our next generation of launchers, Ariane 6 and Vega C. These rockets and the reusable space rider 
will ensure that Europe continues to have autonomous and affordable access to space. Once in space, mission controllers are operating spacecraft around the clock to watch our planet, study the universe, and explore the solar system. We've flown more than 80 missions, including Rosetta, which landed Philae on Comet 67P, and Huygens, which touched down on Saturn's moon. We operate a worldwide network of ground stations to keep in contact with missions anywhere. ESA is dedicated to making space safer. Our teams help spacecraft to avoid collisions with space debris, and we are developing new techniques to deorbit dead satellites. We bring high-tech telescopes to scan the night sky for asteroids and missions to monitor our sun. With these technologies, early warnings can be delivered about potential asteroid impacts or hazardous solar activity that can affect infrastructure on Earth. ESA's diverse activities are all part of a clear vision for Europe in space. Space is the future, and through ESA, we are all part of it. This is ESA. Okay, so there we go. Um, that's just a little bit about ESA. I mean, I think just amazing work goes on. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure now to hand over to James Carpenter, as I said, scientist at the European Space Agency. Um, and really looking forward to hear about the exciting work going on at the moment. Thanks, James. Thanks very much. And that, well, actually, I haven't seen that video before. It's a great video. Um, so let me, I'm just gonna share my screen. So I hope you can see some slides that I have. Okay, so can you just confirm that you can see some slides? Great, and yeah. you can hear me. Yeah, I can see them. I can hear you. Okay, great. So, so thanks for thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is James Carpenter. I'm from the European Space Agency. Uh, my my full job title is I'm Exploration Science and Research Coordinator for the Directorate of Human and Robotic Exploration. Yeah. And what that means is uh, I'm involved in trying to pull together the, the science and research activities that uh, we're going to do on the future missions that we're planning to go beyond Earth orbits to the Moon and onwards to Mars. Um, so this is a, it's a huge amount of stuff that we can do. Um, and some of that is about really fundamental science, um, understanding the universe and our place in the solar system and the history of, of life in the universe. Some of that is about preparing the future. So it's about um, working out if we want to send humans and technology out into space and to, to send humans to Mars and to build capabilities and expand our economic sphere beyond Earth, what does it take to do that? And what are the, the research gaps, the, the science and research that we need to do to make that possible? And so, um, so a bit about my background. I was, I was always into space. Even as a very young child, I was into space. And then at some point, um, I started secondary school and um, I stopped really dreaming about this. It was never really a career, right? It was something that I was interested in, that I was fascinated by. I had like space books, I liked sci-fi films, but it was never really a job. And then it wasn't until I was about 16 years old when I was just starting to think about what I could do at university when I, I found a couple of university courses, which were included space science and technology. And I, I realized for the first time that people in Europe were working on this stuff and that actually space was a career option. That, that this is really something that I could do. And that changed my life. Um, and I went actually from being a very quite arts orientated um, to being very science and mathematics orientated almost overnight. It was a bit of a catch up, um, but that's sort of how I ended up where I am now. And so um, what I would hope to try and get across to you today is that there are some really exciting things going on now. Over the next uh, decade, there's some really exciting stuff coming. And then I'd like to give you a, an idea of the kind of thing that might happen in your career and what the implications of that could be. So I'm going to start fairly close to home uh, with the program that we in the European Space Agency have um, between the ground and Earth orbit within the Human Spaceflight and Exploration Program. So we have sounding rockets, which are rockets which go up just to the edge of space and then they fall back down again. 
And in doing so, they, they create really good microgravity. So really nice zero gravity conditions during the falling. And this is really useful for scientific experiments. We can also simulate this low gravity environment with parabolic flights on aircraft, which fly these parabolic um, shapes in the sky, where you also get these microgravity, zero gravity environment for science. And we have laboratories on the ground that we can use. But then we go to the International Space Station. Now, this is the most complex thing that humans have ever created. Um, it's a, a partnership between multiple nations, the United States, European nations, uh, Japan, Russia, and Canada. And it's a place where humans have lived and worked now for a very long time. And what I think is really cool about this is that in my, not even in my lifetime, during my career, low Earth orbit has gone from being somewhere you went to explore to somewhere you go to work. And, and that's something that's absolutely extraordinary. So now we, we people live and work in space all the time on the International Space Station. The other thing I think is really awesome about it is that it is the only place that I can think of where all of these different nations every single day are working in peace and harmony to do something that is extraordinary. And, and so um, I think this is something that is just remarkable and it gives me hope for the future and it tells me that, that we in Europe can do this, we in the world can do this. And just to show you, this is uh, my colleague, Samantha Cristoforetti. Um, She's also a Star Trek fan, as you can see. And this is her on the International Space Station during her six month mission, um, pointing out of the window to the, uh, the Dragon spacecraft, which is a robotic spacecraft from SpaceX in the US, which provides cargo to the International Space Station. So moving on from low Earth orbit, um, we go to the moon. And this is where things are really just starting for us now in Europe. We're really just getting going on this. Um, and so there is a very exciting international plans to go to the moon. So pretty much every nation now um, is, has aspirations to start getting involved in the moon. So um, there is the, the Artemis program from the US, which plans to put humans on the moon during this decade. China has very extensive plans for um, exploration of the moon in the, the coming decade and more. Um, but also new, new countries are getting involved. So India has China has a, um, lunar missions. Um, and one of the things that's driving this is the understanding, increasing understanding that the moon is a really important archive of the history of the solar system. And so if you want to understand the history of the solar system and the early history of our own planet around the time when life was emerging, then the moon is actually the only place you can go to do that. We're also learning that the moon may be rich in resources that could be used for future exploration. So we know that there is ice at the poles of the moon, both the North and South Pole, which contains water and other things which could be used to supply life support systems, but also oxygen is hydrogen and oxygen um, in water. And those two together are also rocket fuel. So this is um, something that is becoming increasingly important. And so lots of countries are trying to get there to understand how we might use this. So in Europe, we're working on, um, on the left hand side here is European service module for something called Orion. And Orion is the US-led spacecraft that will take humans into deep space for the first time since Apollo. And Orion will go somewhere called the Gateway, which is a, an orbital outpost that we're now working to build in the orbit near to the moon. Um, this will be somewhere where we can um, prepare the missions to go down to the surface and back again. But we can also use that to learn how to live and work in space, in deep space, away from the Earth for long periods of time to prepare for missions to Mars. And so we in Europe are also now working on developing some of the modules and equipment that will be part of this international gateway to the moon. Down at the lunar surface, we're working on um, um, a number of missions with international partners. So one of those is Luna 27, which is a Russian-led mission. And to these different missions, we're providing um, scientific equipment uh, and other things. And a lot of these missions are focused on this polar exploration. So trying to get to the lunar poles to understand where there's water ice, how much is there, where it comes from, what it can tell us about the, the history of this chemistry, which is important for life in the inner solar system, but also uh, how we might use this to enable exploration in the future. And then going beyond that, in the latter part of this decade, we're now working on something we call the European Large Logistics Lander, 
which would be a large lander that can provide one and a half tons of mass of, to, of scientific equipment or cargo to the surface so we can have robotic missions to explore but also to provide equipment for um, the missions of uh, humans which are coming and just to show you this is also this is something that's, that's increasingly real this is the orion uh, the first orion spacecraft for the the first test flight of orion um, at um, cape kennedy at, um, in, the, in the us at, at, um, and um, on the bottom part of this you'll see the european service module or on the right hand side of this you can see the nasa and esa logos together on this which is the, the first deep space human exploration spacecraft since the apollo era so really a new era of exploration is beginning and then as we move on we have a, an aspiration eventually to have humans going to mars now this is an international aspiration but it's something that is, is quite somewhere off in the future and there's an awful lot we have to do to get there and so there's a number of steps you might, we need to take, both in terms of learning, doing more science at Mars, but also building the capabilities and the, the knowledge that we need to be able to send to humans later. So right now, we have something called the, the Trace Gas Orbiter around Mars, accompanying a, a mission called Mars Express. And the Trace Gas Orbiter is looking at the, the atmosphere of Mars and looking in particular for, for methane and gases that could be indicators that there's life or existing on Mars now. We're also building, uh, ready for launch in 2022, a rover mission called ExoMars, and uh, that will drive on the lunar surface. It will drill beneath the surface and look for chemical traces of life past and present um, on Mars. And uh, we're now, so that's been built, it's been prepared for launch in 2022. And at the same time, we're working on the next big robotic mission to Mars which is Mars sample return. In fact, this is a mission so big that it's not just one mission, it's several missions. And the first part of that will be a, a NASA mission called Perseverance, which has launched, it's on its way to Mars now, and that will collect samples. The next mission will take will be a rover, which goes and collects those samples a bit to bring them back to uh, another uh, lander, which will then launch them back up into space. Um, we in ESA are working on the sample fetch rover, but also the mission that would follow that um, which is called the Earth Return Orbiter, which would be the mission which captures that sample in orbit um, and then brings it back to Earth. And this actually be the, the largest spacecraft that's ever been sent to, to, to Mars. Um, and so we're going to take those uh, samples and bring them back to Earth. It'll be the first time ever for these samples, which may contain traces of life on Mars, can be distributed to, to laboratories around the world. So this is a really exciting decade of things that we're working on now. So things that are in process now and things that are coming. And just to show you again, this is this is ExoMars, um, the, the, the rover mission which was drilled beneath the surface being launched in 2022. And this is the rover being assembled, um, ready for, for um, uh, to be sent for, for integration and for launch. So what I hope you can see is that there's a lot that's coming. Um, there's a lot that's happening, a lot that's coming that's very exciting. But then I think, like, if I'm with you, what I would, want to, I would want to know, where is all this going? Where does it lead? And so I would like, perhaps, then, to, to take you on a little imaginary journey um, to a possible future. This is not necessarily the future. If I could predict that, I'd be very wealthy. But this is a possible future, and maybe a future that maybe you could help to create. Um, and so I'd like to start by jumping forwards to the year 2050. And have to think about maybe what, what could we imagine what might you achieve in your careers so to, bit, to bit, give you a bit of context the the last decades it's 2050 and the last decades have been brutal so extreme weather and rising global temperatures have really taken their toll uh, forests are burning um sometimes several cities are now under water um, but climate change is now a clear existential threat to the future of the planet and our species. Nobody likes this anymore. Um, and a massive global effort to find technology and science solutions to this has been undertaken for the last 25 years. But there is a plan, and Europe has led the way. And energy is the key. So the solution, which has now been realized in Europe and is being targeted by major nations internationally, is to transition to completely carbon-free energy. 
And this, we need so much energy that we need to both supply human needs and to actively extract carbon from the atmosphere at a huge scale. Now, this energy comes from a balanced combination of sources, from uh, nuclear, from terrestrially sourced renewables, and from solar power being from space. Now, the idea of solar power being being from space is that you create very, very large collecting arrays that collect sunlight in geostationary Earth orbit. They convert that energy into microwave and then beam it down to the surface of the Earth. Now, this allows you to provide continuous, constant, reliable energy at the point of need, regardless of weather or seasonal variations in sunlight. It's not the most cost effective. It's not the cheapest way of generating that energy but it does provide consistency and security of supply. It's scalable into the future. In principle, there's no limit to the size you can make these things. And it allows you to provide, uh, to decouple the energy supply from other constraints around distribution or the use of land on earth, especially in Europe where land is, is very scarce. Now, in order to, to do this, it was realized quite early on that to build and operate such large facilities would require the use of resources from space or not just supplied from Earth. So while key components and equipment are being sent from Earth, the massive structures and collectors that need to be manufactured are being done using materials retrieved from uh, the recycling of space debris and from materials produced on the moon. Now the fuel that you need to operate these stations for the transportation around this lunar system and to provide their station keeping um, is, all, is produced from uh, water and uh, fuel propellant that's prepared from what's been found at the poles of the moon. Now, this has also created spin-out benefits. So one of the things that happened is that substantial investments in creating this space-based solar power have led to the build-up of extensive and complex activity, both at the moon and in Earth orbit, and has driven new capabilities for human spaceflight and robotic activities. Now, the result is that now hundreds of humans and large-scale robotic installations are now distributed permanently across these, across these uh, locations. So humans are now living in space near the Earth and they're living and working in artificial habitats that are rotating to simulate gravity and providing protection from radiation using lunar water as a radiation shield. At the same time, humans living on the surface of the Moon are living in habitats which are covered with lunar soil and water to protect from radiation power during the two-week night on the moon is provided by fuel cells which are charged with solar energy during the day and uh, solar energy being from lunar orbit provides power for extended sorties away from this centralized infrastructure. At the same time these new capabilities for exploration have also enabled the first human mission to Mars and so now we have human missions going to Mars um, and actively working and doing science there. So Europe is now currently deeply engaged in a deep drilling mission on Mars. And this is there to access and explore a, a lake of water buried deep, more than a kilometer beneath the Martian surface. And this lake was discovered through a combination of orbiting European missions and geophysical measurements made at the surface. And scientists are now confident that this is the most likely place on Mars to find life living now and the question of whether or not we are alone in the universe is about to be answered. So that's 2050. And now I'd like to jump forward another 50 years to 2100 and the future that your children might see. So it's now 50 years later and climate change has been stopped and reversed through massive scale geoengineering powered in part through space solar power. The Earth has an abundance of clean energy available for human activity, and the resultant economic growth has allowed the elimination of poverty across the planet, dramatically improving the living conditions of billions of people compared to one century earlier. The population of Earth has also declined, with large swathes of the planet now devoted to preserving ecosystems. However, the human population is actually larger than at any time in history, with most humans now living in space in artificial free-floating habitats constructed and maintained using space resources from asteroids. And the quality of life here is good, which is why people stay. The abundance of resources and energy and the quality and scale of the habitats ensure that people want to be there. 
The move to space habitats was initially driven by migration, people wanting to move there for jobs, but then they stayed. And now a new generation has emerged, the first generation of humans to have been born off world. So that's a possible future. It's not the future, but all the things that we're doing now are going to lead to something else. And the important thing is this is the future that you are going to create. That's my version of the future, but I would like to know what is your version of the future. And I think the choices that you make now and the career choices that you make and the directions you go will create the future for you and for your children and for my grandchildren. So I would just encourage you to think carefully about what you want to do next and to think big and think bold and be encouraged that there are solutions to the problems that we see and the challenges that we see in the world today. And uh, you can be a massive part of solving these problems, addressing these challenges and produce something that is both wonderful and awesome. And I look forward to seeing what you're going to do. Thank you. Oh, thank you, James. That was just fantastic. And it's lovely to see a future, your future so hopeful that 2100, that we will have reversed some of the things that we're working on now. Um, beautiful, thank you. And beautiful, um, beautiful graphics and everything. So, so really, really, really interesting. Now, for some of you, you're now going to move into a breakout room to have a further discussion with James and ask him um, some questions. So um, Alan, our head astronomer at um, Black Rock Castle Observatory, is just going to come on and explain that. And um, we're going to have a slight, po um, a little bit of a, a little bit of entertainment for a few minutes. And uh, we're going to run a quiz as well. And details of that are going to be explained now. Um, Alan, are you there to take us through what's going to happen next? Yes, Black Rock Castle is here. Absolutely, Neil. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, what's the weather like where you are, Alan? Uh, there's plenty of life here. Um, <laughs> um, so, yes, so welcome to Space Week all. I hope you're very much enjoying uh, the fantastic uh, presentations so far by Neve, Stephanie and James. Um, and I, I know that you're going to enjoy uh, Hannah, Niall and, and others uh, going forward as well. So, um, so I'm going to move you to your respective rooms at the minute. Some of you are going to stay in the main room and some of you are going to go to a second room, okay? Uh, that some of, for some of you, it might take a couple of seconds, but please bear with us and we will ensure that you get to your correct room. If you have any issues, just drop us a line and I'll have no problem getting back to you. Thanks, Alan. And then just dropped in the chat there, Rob, who is the communications manager at Black Rock Castle Observatory. If you check in the chat, he's just dropped a link to Cahoots for you to do a quiz for the next few minutes. And there's Rob. Rob, how are you? What's going Hi, on? Everybody. So I've just dropped a link for the quiz and you're going to be asked for a pin number to plug in. And I'm just going to share that in the chat now as well. And that should only take three or four minutes to compete, but uh, I kind of want to see how you guys do. So just copy and paste that pin into the quiz and off you go. Thanks, Rob. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. So while we just wait for people to get into the breakout sessions, you do the pins there and, um, and off we go. That was really fascinating, that discussion with uh, James, wasn't it? I mean, it's really incredible what the European Space Agency are involved in and particularly that they're involved in that massive um, gateway mission to return to the moon by 2024. It's, it's very, very promising for us as Europeans to be a part of that. And I love his vision. And of course, they're all planning now for Vision 2050, where they're looking at submissions from people to plan, where are we going to be in 30 years time? So people like you are going to be senior researchers on that if you want to have a part in space careers. So um, I think you just are, you are coming into um, into your careers at the perfect time to be involved in a really exciting phase of, um, of space research, space science and space exploration. So I think we can continue with our speakers now. Um, is that OK? Alan, come in or Danielle or Rob. Is it OK for me to now move on to our next speaker? Is that all right? Yeah, you can continue. Uh, we're nearly, you, nearly there, but yeah, you can continue. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Alan. It's like he's in kind of mission control or something. He's this voice from above. I love it. OK, so now um, the next speaker is from Inner Labs, and they actually are uh, featured in today's Irish Times, if you want to check that out. So uh, this is a fantastic company that's just 
uh, storming ahead, trailblazing in, in their area of um, the space industry. And, and Hannah is no exception. And we're really lucky that we have Hannah uh, joining us this morning. And just to repeat Stephanie's amazing introduction of Hannah, she works at Inalabs Limited. She's a space reliability engineer. A what? She's going to tell you and she's going to be talking to you about testing components and the reliability of products in space and also what made her decide to have the career that she has good morning hannah how are you where are you what's the weather like well i'm in dublin like yourself and it's gotten it's actually brightened up from what i can see ah. i'm just gonna go and share my slides with everyone thanks hannah i'm gonna go on mute okay thank you come no back to me for anything can you guys see my slides? Yeah, I can see them. Brilliant. So hello, my name is Hannah. I'm a space reliability engineer and I work here in the Irish space industry and I work in a company called Inalabs. And what we focus on is research and building of gyroscopes and accelerometers that usually end up in space on board of satellites. So I, I just wanted to kind of talk about why did I come into this area of a career so I was pretty like I have to admit kind of like James I was very young and I knew I wanted to like I liked space not necessarily that I wanted to be involved in it I just liked it so uh, it was probably I was actually very young uh, I was probably about 12 and it was like I think it was like 2006 and I remember that summer being so rainy and uh, this summer before was like a heat wave and I was excited for another summer like that except we didn't and I ended up uh, sitting in one day and watching a documentary series on the History Channel called The Universe and the episode was about the sun and that was the title of the uh, show and uh, it pretty much told the story of what the sun means to us, what does it mean to earth, um, what is the sun, what, how does it even form, so it told us from the birth, its life story and what will possibly be its death and beyond that. Um, I really do remember just sitting there and I caught myself sitting on the edge of the seat with my mouth wide open, like in awe of, like, I was just in awe of like, how could us humans understand how an object like the sun works? Like, how do we understand like, oh, it's fusion. How did we, how did we get to that? So I remember during the documentary, uh, seeing these scientists, uh, just uh, popping up, telling us all this information. And I remember them being like a theoretical physicist, an astrophysicist, a cosmologist. And I was like, who are these people? I was like, I've never, i never heard of them before. I ended up then kind of like just running into the kitchen, opened my laptop, looked up, who is it? Like, what are the physicists? Like, who are these people? And it told me these are like people who studied like how the world, like the try and figure out how the world works and uh, see and carry out experiments to see like, oh, this theory ends to be true. Um, so that's what I was fascinated by. I was like, wow, I want to be a physicist. Um, now you may see by my title, I'm not by title a physicist, but I can tell you one thing, I did get my physics degree in the end. So to move on, I uh, became, like I am now, I'm a space reliability engineer. And like Neve said, what is it? Because I didn't know what it was either until I started doing the role. I am, um, so what I am is in space, um, you have to, components in space have to survive the space environment and it's very, very harsh. And um, so what I do is I do multiple of things. It's a very diverse job in a way, like I do, uh, statistical modeling of components so I'd get um like I'd be usually involved in like the designing of a product so I come at really early stages be talking to like electronics teams the system engineers and they'd be telling me what they want or what values are expected to succeed and how long that component needs to survive in space in these conditions so I do a statistical analysis like a maths model where you find the information you need from like standards uh, to find the uh, the like statistical value to that this component or this product will survive in space or what's the chances of it failing in space. Um, this is um, this is very good because it means I can turn around and be very early on in the in the stages of developing a product and be like 
look, we don't have, like, so this component won't succeed in space, we need to change it now, instead of later on finding out it doesn't work in testing, when it could have been figured out earlier on using maths. Um, sometimes there's components that are key in a product, and it means that, okay, I can't really, don't have much wiggle room, so I need to start doing de-risking experiments. So what I do is, for example, a common one would be, like, we do uh, radiation analysis and we also do uh, like thermal analysis. So sometimes it's going to be really expensive. Uh, it's going to be really expensive to change the component and you kind of don't want the cost to go high. So I'm going to go off and I'll spend like a week testing a component to see will it survive uh, at this temperature range and like fluctuating it really fast back and forth uh, to see would it break, can it survive these like like ridiculous changes i'm literally pushing it to its limits and um, also then what i do is i do i'm involved in loads of meetings and um, i have to obviously present what i i can i'm like sometimes i can be the bearer of really good news to a team or a, a bearer of really bad news to a team and be like no it's not going to survive or yes it's it's going to survive and like full speed ahead and um, so for example, uh, yesterday, I, I was actually meant to do a test with uh, you, uh, the guys at Black Rock Observatory, but I got a change till Tuesday. And it's because yesterday morning, I was actually in a meeting with the European Space Agency. And they were, we were going through what we call a preliminary design review. And um, they need to see like our preliminary design and changes that we found during it that we need to change. And then we present them afterwards in the next few months, we uh, present a critical design review and it's called the CBO for short. And that'll be like our final design. We'll have an engineering model, which we'll test and we'll see if we can break or not break. And then we have a qualification model, which is pretty much what we would get as close to a flight model. And when it's a flight model, hands are off. That is, that is the product now. There's no changing it. That's going to space. That's up to standards. It has been tested beyond un un like unbelievable like it will not like it will survive in this space environment so it's the amount of analysis to get a space product through is ridiculous it's, it's amazing how much goes into it and um, so yes yeah, so that's what a space reliability engineer is it's it's very varied i work with lots of standards i actually have one here these are actually space standards and these, this here is a uh, space project assurance, which is usually what a reliability engineer would take out of what we call ECSS standard, the European Corporation Space Standards. And within here, they have the, loads of documents. This is only one and it's a nice small one. Usually they are much bigger than this. And this has all the information you need on like what needs to be involved in analysis, what needs to be taken into account. And um, so these are the types it's a very intense job. There's a lot of responsibility because you have to prove to the team that this is this like component on the board will succeed in, in this harsh, really harsh space environment. And when you're in a reliability engineer, you truly understand how harsh the this, this space environment truly is. It's, it's a really hard environment to for a satellite to uh, to be in. Uh, so my next slide, I'm just going to go on and talk about pretty much when I was in your guys' um, stage, uh, when I was in secondary school. So I'm going to give you like a lowdown on my, my um, educational background. So for my leaving cert, I studied, I'd say the very basic, like the basic subject, subjects would be like English, project maths, Irish, and then French as well. And then I chose the following subjects. I chose geography because I wanted to like, I wanted to know about the earth. Like I knew I wanted to do physics, but I wanted to know, and like, I wanted to know like how the earth worked first before going on and discovering all about the universe. Uh, so I wanted to do that. I wanted to do geography at the Leaving Cert. And then I wanted to do chemistry and physics, physics because I wanted to do physics, but because they kind of complement each other uh, quite nicely, the two sciences do. And then I did applied maths and uh, applied maths was, is definitely one of the subjects that helps me a lot, especially when I, you went, when I went on into college. It's kind of like it gives you the maths capability for first and maybe halfway through second year of college. So I found that a huge help. If anyone's interested in going down this route, applied maths is a subject I would highly recommend. And to be honest, I'm in a career where, yes, I'm a physicist, but um, I use a lot of maths, um, so it's it's very handy. 
to have. So I'm going to go on to what I did at university. So I carried out a bachelor's degree in physics with energy and environment at Technological University of Dublin. At the time, it was called Dublin Institute of Technology uh, when I attended. And it's a four year program. And uh, in your third year, you do a seven month placement. And then I went, once I completed my undergraduate, which I'll go further into detail in my next slide, because each summer I took part in a lot of internships and I'll go into that later on. But uh, I'll move on to what I did for my master's. So I decided during my third year placement that I wanted to do this master's in University College of Dublin, UCD, and it's in space science and technology. And that was so much fun. I'll go into detail on that now on my next slide. So what have I done? Uh, so at each summer, uh, I don't know, like when you go to university, you actually have quite large breaks. And I was thinking back, I remember back in October 1st year thinking, oh my God, like I'm going to forget so much between first and second year of uni. So I, was, I must do something in relation to it. Even if it's a week long, I was thinking, just do something uh, in relation to physics. So my first year, I actually was very lucky. And now I did, I went, I mean, I started in November and I only got my internship for my first year summer by June, but I've been asking since November. So it takes a long time. You get loads of no's before you ever get a yes. Uh, but believe me, once you start building it up, uh, you get less no's and more yeses as the years go on. Uh, so I did it in physics education in my first year. And what we were looking at was like, looking at people's capability to understand physics coming into their degree and then finishing first year of their degree. And um, we, we were looking at like, well, did they improve? Did they become better physicists in the end? And then to the reason we we're checking this was because there was a program called Peerwise where uh, undergraduates would give, uh, would make physics questions and they would also answer their peers physics questions and they wanted to see if you're actively like ask uh, uh, making questions in physics like you have to understand what you're asking the person to, so that you know what's the right answer so it, we wanted to see was there an improvement which there were <laughs> so it was a definitely a success and um, then in my second year my supervisor in my first year uh, internship told me that he, I was I kept talking to him about like oh CERN's amazing which they are and I said, I'm interested in particle physics. And then he told me that he knew someone in the University of Glasgow that I could do a Erasmus with. So if you don't know what Erasmus is, it's kind of a, it's a program you can do uh, in your undergraduate where like you can maybe take a year in, at another university or do one semester at a university or do what I did where I took the summer, which was a summer traineeship. A Erasmus summer traineeship was the name of it. And I went to the University of Glasgow where I worked with the LHCB uh, CERN group uh, there in the physics department, in particle physics department. And I worked on their data tapes. And just so you know, uh, so these detectors in CERN, um, they have like tapes that are feeding back to us, the computers. And what it is, is some of these machines actually kind of move. Now, what I mean they move, they move very little. And um, uh, the tapes are kind of like cardboard in material. They're very like old and they kind of over time have like little bends in them and this affects the data they feel like. So they wanted to update the data tapes. So that's what I was working on. I was working on these smaller, really fancy data tapes and looking at if I kept bending it over a period of time and get, keep feeding it data, would it affect uh, the outcome? Um, and it didn't. And that update to CERN on those data tapes happened in 2018. So that was pretty cool. Um, I also then did a plasma physics um, internship where we looked at how ionized gas um, can be used to sterilize grain instead of using pesticides. So like if you harvest the grain, you put it through this tunnel and you spray it out the other end, there's this is, a, is a sterilized that we don't we don't have to use pesticides or like harm an, other animals that could be like affected using pesticides this might be a better method and that's what I, I was part of the team that was working on that and then I came to my third year and I had my seven month placement coming up and I realized hmm I wanted to do astrophysics when I started my physics degree and I ended up speaking to Peter Gallagher at Trinity College Dublin 
And he said, well, I am actually in the middle of building a telescope and it's a radio telescope and it's going to be in Burr County Offaly. And uh, I was like, wow, I was like, can I be part of it? And he was like, would you like to be part of it? I went, we talked and he was happy to put me on the team. And I was a part of what is called ILOFAR, which is a low frequency array. I'm actually going to show you on the next slide. This is me sitting on the high band antennas. I forget how big it is. Every time I look at this picture, I'm like, whoa, the telescope is actually much bigger than I even remember it myself. Um, it's um, it's probably, I'd say like, it's probably like the size of Crow Park. Um, it's really big. Um, so these are high band antennas. And if I go back down near the, down at the bottom, you might see like antennae sticking out of the ground. They're low band antennas. And we, what, I think it was like eight weeks we spent during the summer building it. But prior to that, I was helping with going down and like um, finding the locations. Like, like you had to go and find the locations because they're specifically made for a certain part of the sky. So I remember it when it was just muck. And uh, when I, now when I look at it, it's just absolutely amazing. It's a, a working telescope. And then I was very lucky afterwards for my bachelor's degree to actually use the telescope um, to operate the telescope to observe a radio galaxy, a supernova remnant and a black hole. And I did that for my undergraduate uh, thesis. Um, after that, I worked in Ada Labs for about three or four months and I worked on their gyroscopes. And um, I did that for a period of the summer, similar work, a bit different to what I'm doing now. And then right after that, I then did a ESA spacecraft operations traineeship, which was a week long and it was so intense. It was in Belgium and it was amazing, absolutely amazing. I have, it, like, um, we covered stuff from like space mission design and um, we actually made our own mission and like try and succeed. So like, if you lost signal, like, if you were like out by Pluto and you lost signal, what would you do if you came across an issue? We learned about uh, communications. We learned about like how to move the spacecraft, how you talk to the payload uh, on board. Um, and then at the end of all, we did present like, this is our mission. And then we were actually trained by a spacecraft operator and he, of Inisa, and he, uh, he would give us a scenario. And it was great, absolutely great fun. It was absolutely amazing. Um, I've actually, everyone on that have kept in contact, which is absolutely fantastic. We're all going on our space adventures together from all over Europe, which is fantastic. Uh, so after I finished that, I arrived back. I was actually talking to Neve earlier. I arrived back in Ireland at two o'clock in the morning um, from uh, just coming in from this traineeship and then six o'clock that morning I woke up to start my master's where I did uh, my master's in UCD in space science and technology and that was so much fun I came in the first day and in the lab we were uh, we were uh, working on a, what they call an EduCube which is like a cube size um, satellite and it's for educational reasons and we had to dismantle it and then reassemble it and then understand how it works and then test it and then check out its GPS. So we had in bios, what's it called, uh, black and white uh, surfaces on it for checking heat. Does it actually really reflect heat or hold heat? It was amazing, absolutely amazing. And then we worked on gamma ray detectors, uh, more of an astrophysics kind of relation there, but you were looking at the science of a mission. And then we worked on these tupper sats which is a Tupperware box where we made our own experiment. We put together a CAD where we constructed like a, like a little tiny experiment on board. And uh, what we did then was we went to uh, Northern Ireland and we launched them on a weather balloon. And you can see up in the top right hand corner is me actually holding the weather balloon with gloves because oil, uh, the, the balloons, uh, can burst just from a human, the oil on the, our skin. So we're all wearing gloves there. And what you're seeing is me looking down intensely at uh, a tubber sat being attached to uh, the balloon and to make sure it was secure. And they all came back successfully. It was great, absolutely great. And then after that, I did a, we do a placement, a work placement. You can either do it at university or in industry. I decided to go into the space industry and I worked there with uh, Railtra Space Systems Engineering. And that's where I started to learn about 
reliability engineering and that's what my ma my uh, master's thesis is on is looking at the prototype board for ESA's Plato mission and its reliability model uh, statistical model of succeeding or failing and I was looking at that and that was what my master's thesis was on um, so I'm just going to go into a little bit more on what my like what Inalabs is doing now. So, so Inalabs involved in a lot of missions here. We're very lucky because um, I can talk kind of about Railtra's Plato that I was involved in because I'm actually involved in Plato in a different way here at Inalabs. And I'll move into the missions we're involved in. Uh, so we have 76 gyroscopes in space. We have 1.5 million hours in space. That's Irish, that's Irish products in space, which is just amazing. Um, we have two products at the moment. We, well, we have four in total, but these two I'm gonna talk about. We have Ariadis and then we have Ariadis NS. So yes, we have similar names, but one has NS at the end. So Ariadis is what we call old space. And it's kind of older technology. It means it takes a longer time to develop because old space, it was very long to develop. And it also is a higher cost. Ariadis NS means new space. It's newer technology and it's low cost and we're kind of using uh, material like uh, cots like off the shelf um, components and seeing can they survive in space and um, because the whole point is we're trying to make space more accessible and to do that we need to make our products cheaper um, to sell uh, so um, this is the two products we have at the moment I actually have a poster behind me so this is Ariadis NS and then over here is Ariadis um, so we've been very lucky, lucky to be selected. So on the ESA Plato mission as a course rate sensor, and then also selected as ESA's LSTM mission. Uh, it's the Copernicus mission, and we're the main gyroscope on board. Such a cool mission as well. Um, I know James spoke about Copernicus, and it's, just, it's perfect because I'm just about to tell us what mission Ireland's involved in. And uh, Ariadis NS, it's going to go with Neve's shirt. This is the hair mission. I was so excited. I remember we were applying because you have to apply for contracts and for uh, to be on board a space mission. And um, I remember it looked good, like we're we going to get it. And I was so excited. And then I was silent, very excited. I was like, oh my God, it's hair. That's an amazing mission. I'll, I'll talk about hair in a minute. And then we're also on multiple Earth observation platforms, both in Europe and outside of Europe, and also European telecom um, satellite platforms as well. Um, so I'm going to actually talk about these missions. I'm actually going to start about talking about HERA. Uh, so um, HERA is an amazing, an amazing mission. Uh, so HERA is a European uh, contribution to the international uh, double stage uh, collaboration with NASA. Uh, will be the first to perform a kinetic impact. NASA will be the first, sorry, NASA will first perform a kinetic impact on a smaller of the two bodies. So there's, it's kind of, um, it's a binary asteroid. There's two of them there. Uh, and then Hera will follow up. I don't know if someone else's mic is on there. Um, with a, uh, yeah, so it will uh, follow NASA's mission um and it will uh, pretty much it will survey the impact it will look at the uh, great scale it'll look at the great scale experiment into a well understood and repeatable uh planetary defense technique so this mission is to be for planetary defense and ireland is one of the gyroscopes on board which is pretty amazing we're part of the fleet to protect earth which is, um, i think it's just fascinating uh, so while doing so, Hera will also demonstrate multiple novel technologies such as auto navigation around the asteroid, like modern driverless cars, which we haven't done before, which is amazing. Again, if this works, this is so going to like it's going to advance the space industry so much. And it's also going to gather critical scientific data to help scientists in future missions, uh, mission planners better understand asteroid uh, composition and structure. And this mission's for 2024. And we're a part of that, which is I just think it's amazing. And like Issa says, dinosaurs didn't have a, a space agency. They couldn't help themselves, but we can. We have our European Space Agency and NASA. And we're going to protect Earth. 
the next ESA mission we're involved in is PLATO. Now, um, NASA is known for like making acronyms that are very, uh, very, very forced. Uh, PLATO means planetary transits and oscillations of stars. It's a medium class mission at the ESA Cosmic Vision Program. This is like a set of missions that are to come out. Um, I think Hera might be one of them. There's a few of them out. Um, and the class meaning, so we're medium class, has to do with the cost, the budget. So there's a small class, medium class, and a large class. Small, I think, is me, uh, small class missions are like a couple of, like tens of millions. Medium class is a couple of hundred million. And then large uh, class is like a billion and more. Uh, so they're quite big missions. Uh, so this one we're part of uh, is PLATO, and its objective is to find and study large numbers of extraplanetary uh, systems, and this is like looking at exoplanets, uh, with the emphasis on looking for terrestrial planets around a habitable zone, around a solar-like star, and a solar-like star is our, like our star, um, so Earth's like, I think it's called a yellow dwarf, is it actually, it's, it's the type of star it is, it's a G-sequence star. Um, so Plato has been designed to investigate seismic activity in stars, which is amazing. I didn't even know we could do this and enabled the precise characteristics of the planet's host star, including its age. Absolutely That's amazing. Cool. And very important information as well, because you, at the age of the star can determine where the habitable zone is within uh, that, so, that system. You're just amazing. I mean, I could listen to you forever, but we um, we probably need you to give us about another two minutes. I'd pick your yeah. pick your favorite for the last two minutes because um, we just have I to keep actually, going. I was going to actually you. give some advice on skills that maybe they can contribute to. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm actually going to move on. So skills uh, I would recommend you guys to look at would be programming. CAD modeling, accurate communication skills, look at scientific thinking, problem solving skills. And when I mean programming and CAD modeling, don't worry, there's free, like this free uses online. You can learn YouTube and Khan Academy. And there's loads of websites out there to give you examples. And um, also you can be involved now in the space industry by just simply maybe doing a project in the BT Young Scientist, in SciFest, the ESB Science Blast, maybe join a coder dojo. And then within Coda Jojo, you can then become part of Coolest Projects, um, which uh, is a competition where whatever you make in your Coda Dojo, you can compete on the world, world stage. And uh, then you can have a CANSAT project, which is part actually of uh, the European Space Agency Resource uh, Education Resource Office. They do it there with Black Rock Observatory. And I know it's quarantine at the moment and we're all in uh, lockdown and uh, I would I would recommend if anyone's in transition year to look into shadowing a student that might not be possible or doing a work placement in the industry but maybe just email and just ask questions to people who are, are in the industry to get an insight into it and uh, possibly help you along the way maybe give you some ideas to do maybe for one of these other events uh, mentioned above so yeah I'll leave it at that I definitely wanted to give you guys what skills to look into and what to get involved in and um, so yeah I think that's everything. Oh, you're amazing. I could just listen to you forever. Your passion is absolutely, it's it's just absolutely like I we can it's palpable and it's infectious. Hannah, that was brilliant. And thanks for taking us through it. And like I said, um, Hannah's company, Inalabs, the general manager, John O'Leary, has an article in today's Irish Times. So she is where it's at. And um, she very kindly um basically kind of lined up the next uh feature that we're going to show you, which is a video about um, the CANSAT scheme, which you've mentioned, Anna. And also when she mentioned the critical design reports, that's actually part of the CANSAT competition. But Hannah, you're a fantastic advocate for Irish space careers. And thank you so much. Um, you should have your own show about <laughs> space careers. You're so good at it. So thank you no. so much. And sorry that I had to interrupt. We're just running a little bit behind. No problem. Thank you. And now people thank are going to go into um, Hannah's breakout room. Rob, do you want to uh, tell I'm us just about gonna that? Stop in for one second, guys, and say to anybody that's at John the Baptist School, I'm after just 
plugging the link to the YouTube channel. So because, because you guys have already done your breakout room, you don't actually need to be on Zoom anymore. So you might actually have a more comfortable and uh, seamless experience if you just watch the remainder of it on YouTube. Now you can still use the comment section to ask any questions. So I've posted that link in there. It's up to you. You can stay on Zoom if you want to, but click the link if you'd rather watch it on YouTube. And yeah, everybody else, I'm going to join you with Hannah in the breakout room in just a second. So make sure you have those questions ready to go. Thanks, Rob. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, so everybody who's going to go to Hannah, go to Hannah. And then we have a video coming about the CanSat uh, competition. So I leave that to you, Rob, to line it up and play. Yep, that's just coming right now. Oh there. Hmm. How's it looking? That's not looking good. Okay. It's not looking good. Okay. It's not looking good. I'll share it here for my video. I've got the same video. So just give me okay. one. Okay. Thanks, Rob. But your Hannah told Why us. Why we have backups? Yeah. Hannah told us all about it anyway. So she's she gave us everything. She was amazing. Amazing. You're so passionate, Hannah. It's it's great, and and the way you explained your subjects and everything, it's um. You clearly love what you do. And already you've had such an amazing career, like being involved in a, a CERN project and then like the ILO FAR, which is an incredible um, a telescope in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And, you know, doing that space science masters in UCD seems to have set you on course. And you're a go getter, mm -hmm. though. You know, you work hard. The fact that you were spending your summers and everything doing that. OK, we're going to try this again. Thanks, Hannah. big thing to come up here to leash and you know compete in the national finals like this is this is it this is all of ireland as the name suggests camsat is a satellite in a can so it's a simulation of a satellite system that fits into a soft drink can a 330 millimeter can camsat is the european the education office here in Ireland is a contract between the European Space Agency and Science Foundation Ireland and uh, we run it in partnership with a number of partners around the country um, including a number of third level uh, partners who run regional competitions. So there's uh, all the Institute of Technologies around Ireland had um, regional competitions and the winners from each of those competitions are here today to launch their satellite again and we have to uh, launch it up in a rocket and see all the different readings that we're going to get from it. We're transmitting our data with antennas. So we have a small thread antenna in the can and then we have an antenna, a YAG antenna, which is the big one, which is plugged into our laptop. And while it's up in the air, we connect it up and then we get to see the data. Uh, we were collecting a GPS uh, acceleration, humidity, light intensity and then the primary mission, which is temperature and atmospheric pressure. It was quite intense because I thought, oh, it'll just go maybe 100 meters in the air. Not at all. It 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 flew really high, and I was I was expecting a little bit of noise, but it was it was intense, and it was a really nice experience. And it gave me gave me goosebumps. Just seeing it launch up into the air, the parachute deploy, watching it sail through the air, and just seeing that that's all your work over the past amount of um, time, and it just kind of it's quite rewarding to be able to see. Uh, everything was loaded into rocket, everything was going great until uh, the rocket fired and uh, our can ended up in the lake. So we, uh, we got its GPS reading and the last one is right over the lake. It's not a space mission, but still here we all encounter problems and we all have to go and we have to fix those problems as a team. And you know, it falling in the lake was one of the problems, but it's not a problem that can be fixed. I think the difference between the classroom environment uh, and this program is the exposure to a real environment that this is actually happening. Cancer is a layer above because it has all the skills. It has the presentation skill, which they most lack. It has the uh, electronic skill, soldering, programming, and there's a lot of cross fertilization in there. For us, for the Institutes of Technology, this project is a great way to reach out to secondary schools in our local catchment area. 
but what we do and try to inform ourselves about is curriculum development at second level and we really feel this project lends itself to the new um, computing curriculum which is out there for second level students they have their vision they pick their components they choose the methods to produce they can they decide who they like to go for sponsorship that's all up to them you know and i think they've done a great job of it and it's true being forced to do that is how they improve as individuals call me cheesy but it teaches you so much as a person because you know it teaches you how to work with people communicate with people and you learn the most about yourself and people in stressful situations my confidence levels were kind of low like i had zero confidence at the beginning but now i have the confidence to be able to go on my own and to talk to people and then like i also developed my leadership skills as well you know if i was in their situation i'd be really putting the contact in bold in my cv in the future you know how, you know it's a big big achievement and big life skills learned over the, the last few months. Every member of my, my team I'd be proud to employ. But what they need to be able to do is convince and convey those ideas to other people. And this is really what the, the, we're, we're trying to do. I mean, it's uh, absolutely amazing. The, the, the work that they are doing is, is really incredible. You don't have to go abroad to look for engineers. We, all the engineers are here and it's a perfect way of tapping onto the students. Through the project, we get to meet local industrial partners. So it's kind of a win, 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 win situation for everyone involved, the colleges, the schools, the teachers, the students, but also local industry, as well as our major funders, like Foundation Ireland. I would encourage students as well, if they're interested in doing this, to approach a teacher and to see, can you bring a team together? Because sometimes it's led by a teacher, but sometimes it can be led by students. All I really want to say is, you know, it's been a real blast coming up here, you know, spending time at all my friends, the team, working hard and solving all of these problems. And, you know, this has been a great experience. Um, that's great. It's a real introduction to getting involved in uh, the space sector. You know, it gives you an idea uh, of what's involved. So um, as people, some of you are headed off to Hannah uh, to speak with her in the breakout room, the rest of us have the luxury of hearing from uh, Dr. Niall Smith. And as already introduced by Stephanie, he is the founder and director of Blackrock Castle Observatory and the head of research at CIT. He studied astrophysics in UCD. There's nothing he doesn't know about the moon. I know I sat through one of his um, talks one night and I was fascinated, but that's not what he's gonna talk about today. Niall is gonna talk about careers in space and space 4.0. So Niall, off you go. How are you and where are you? You look like you're in an office, so that's a luxury. Well, actually I'm in uh, the box room at home. Oh, are you? What I think is really interesting, Neve, is if we were all to turn our cameras around to show what we don't oh. want, interesting it's it's less it's less well considered just in front of me than it is right at the minute behind me we have our uh calendar of the moon of course mm -hmm. as well, which hopefully most schools will have got at this stage yeah and i on the phase of the moon and some things that are going on as well so yeah so it's been a great morning so far i have to say and i'm only sad that it's up to me now to do the talking because quite frankly i was enjoying listening but anyway I, I, I guess I better get on with this um, and, and see how we go. What I wanted to do, a couple of points. First of all, so, um, we, we've kind of seen James looking into the, the, a lot of work that ESA does on the far distant future, which was really interesting, and Hannah looking at particular things that you can do in a career. I want to try to sit in the sort of middle ground somewhere uh, and talk about careers that might be forged with the help of space as distinct from careers that are necessarily part of space. I've been lucky to, for the most part, have a career which has allowed me to look out at the universe and in more recent times to start to consider how we uh, unlock the power of space for, for all our good. Um, one of the things that, that uh, is, is an advantage of, of coming last is uh, you can pick up on some of the comments that others have made and I think one of the things that James had said and reinforcing it by Hannah, for everyone, the future is not determined we can influence it and in fact you can influence it. So there might be a lot of commentary at the moment which would give an impression that we're all going in one direction and that things are going only in one direction. But people and understanding the laws of the universe uh, can allow us to reverse 
issues which we've either brought upon ourselves or which have been imposed upon us, depending on what way. So the first comment is by knowing stuff, by being educated, by being able to solve problems, you can change uh, the future. Um, back in December 24, 1968, there was this picture taken of the moon, which was really a very stereotypical picture, really an impactful picture, showing the Earth rising above the moon. And you can kind of see a big difference between the two. One appears to show very little color differences, the other shows large color differences. And that largely is derived from the fact that one is effectively devoid of life and the other is teeming with life. There are no boundaries from space. And that's something that astronauts say all the time. And that's something that I think by studying space, we really need to bring into all our thinking. In fact, if you go even further out, if you go just to a little bit further in the solar system, which in the greater scheme of things is you're still right on the doorstep. You're not, you actually haven't even opened the back door in terms of going anywhere in space. But even from that very close distance, the Earth then gets to be seen as this as some of you might be familiar with this phrase, a pale blue dot. It becomes insignificant, it becomes irrelevant in the universe. And so using spacecraft, we get an image or a perspective which says the following. The Earth is sitting uh, on its own in a very large universe and we need to protect it. So let's work together to protect it. Because from outside, all of this boundaries and all of this strife and all of this issue about who's better than whom, looks irrelevant. So it really is something that space has done for us in the last 50 years. Now, many of you, in fact, all of you in the schools here will have, apart from your teachers, perhaps will have, will have grown up with this idea of looking from these distances and seeing pictures like that. But if you're my age, these pictures were new at the time. They changed the way we looked at our universe. For you, it's part of the way you may look at your universe. I wanted to talk about a couple of different points and I wanted to link them into um, the sustainable development goals only, only very briefly. But I wanted to really get people asking questions because I'm, I'm guessing that in amongst a thousand of you, some of you may have a view that your life's career is going to reduce poverty. So can space help to reduce poverty? Well, first of all, there's over 800 million people who are in poverty around the world. But space can help to do that. And one obvious way that it can do that is by helping to grow food more efficiently. This is in the short term. James showed images of maybe in 100, 150 years time. And that's really important that we work towards that. In the immediate term, if we take pictures of crops, for example, we're showing here using infrared, which is just a slightly different variant on the, 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 the wavelengths that your eyes can see, we can see some regions which are red in color, some which are, which are green. These are not real colors. They're colors that are there just to help us to understand the images. And where there's red, there's crop growth because as things grow, they emit heat. And that's a byproduct of, of, of life always is, is emitting heat. So we can see where the crops are growing, where they're not growing, and we can take corrective action. And that is, makes us um, improve the efficiency of our agriculture by up to 90% in some locations. So that's amazing. And that's facilitated by images from space. If we talk about education globally, then we talk about how we're going to connect people across the world. This is a map from 2018. It's only a couple of years old. If you're in the black part of the map, then you're doing okay. If you're in the area which is orange or yellow, you're really not doing well. You're effectively not connected to the internet. Now, now why does that matter? Well, a really good example, of course, is that during this pandemic, we've all remained connected because of the internet. We've all been able to continue despite lockdowns and all sorts of other issues to, to run our educational system. It's been a strain. People have to work very hard. Absolutely. People have done fantastic, but they've been facilitated. Their efforts have been facilitated by having this connectivity. If you're one of the three billion people who are not connected to the Internet, your connection to education, your connected connection to news, your ability to talk to one another is severely degraded and severely limited. So you fall behind potentially the rest of the world. We don't want to live in a world where that happens. We want to live in a world where everybody can, be, can, can work similarly together. That's what the sustainable development goals are all about. So we can, we can connect people in different ways. We can use satellites that are very far. It was already mentioned geostationary orbit, or we can look at new ways of doing this. So here's an example of, a, of a, a, a bunch of satellites. Each of these boxes here or these squares is, is a satellite. This is a graphic image. This doesn't exist in this format yet in space. 
here we're showing somebody trying to talk from London, in this instance, to New York. So they beam a signal up to the satellite, then the yellow lines show the, the beam going between satellites, and then in this case, now it's flipped to San Francisco. What's really exciting about this is this two things. One, it uses low Earth orbit satellites, which both Hannah and James refer to. And low Earth orbit satellites are cheaper to put up because you have to put them up less high. They're less environmentally problematic, other than that they light up the night sky. That's a different discussion, which, which is for a, for a different presentation. But one of the really exciting things is the laws of physics tell us that if you're in a vacuum, such which you would be in space, the speed at which you can tr transmit things is almost 50% faster than in a fiber. So if you're doing some sort of telemedicine, you're in, in London or you're in Ireland, you're in Cork, or you're, you're in any village in, 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 the, in the world that can connect to this network, then you could be a surgeon who's using telerobotics uh, at, at a distance. And you will be at least 50, if not more, percent faster in when you move your hands in, let's say, Cork with what happens in South Africa. So this opens up a whole new world of telemedicine, which is much quicker than what we can currently do with the best fibers. So this is an exciting possibility, but it's not fully realized. So if I was you, I'd be thinking, okay, that's great. This doesn't exist completely in this form. I want to get involved because that's going to help ultimately maybe to help people with, uh, with health issues. Or if I'm becoming a surgeon, because that's what I want to do, I need to keep an eye on what are the developments in space that will allow me to do my surgery in a way which in 2020 seems almost like science fiction. If we go to ask about water, of course, we know that water is critical to life and there are life forms that don't need oxygen. There are no life forms that don't need water. But 40% of the world's population lives in areas with a scarcity of water. This is a picture taken by one of the European Sentinel satellites just in the last week. It actually shows that in, in France, in the, in, the, in the central region of France here, you can see the brown shows that are in a drought. Here's a big surprise, Ireland isn't in a drought at the moment. But you can actually see that soil moisture, which isn't about rainfall directly, it's about how much moisture is in the soil, helps farmers to predict, for example, what they're, when they should plant crops and where they should plant crops and so forth. But really interestingly, what, soil moisture and water doesn't always exist on the surface. In fact, a significant percentage of the fresh water on the planet is subsurface water. Of course, we always think of the oceans as water, but they're full of salt. You can't put them on plants and crops and so on. You can't drink it directly. But there's a lot of fresh water in underground locations, and satellites can help us to detect that. So this is an example of a, of a region in Botswana. If you look at the, the there's some... Uh, in, uh, tributaries and rivers going here where people would would traditionally live but actually the big blue stuff down around here is where you have subsurface water and so if you drill wells and bring that water either you, you either set a new community up there or you bring the water to where communities already exist you have a way of supporting communities living in harsh environments who wouldn't have necessarily known that there was subsurface water available to them Suppose you're a tech head and suppose you want to just build satellites and Hannah certainly gave us a good reason why we might want to get involved in being part of satellite projects. Well, satellites indeed are in general getting smaller and there's a, there's a bunch of reasons why they're getting smaller and they're also, as Hannah mentioned, using components off the shelf. One of the really exciting developments and Inno Labs again is an example of this is the increasing participation of private companies. So suppose you're an entrepreneur, suppose you don't really want to actually just do the satellite bit but you're looking for a business opportunity and, and space might provide some of those for you well private companies are increasingly getting involved and they're in, the number of them that are getting involved and the amount of money they need to set up the amount of money is going down and the number of them is going up so what we're starting to kind of see is a democratization of getting to space and what that also does is it allows people much it's changed the way we look at things so we've had large agencies like the european space agency and nasa amazing agencies which have done amazing things for us and that's already been outlined but often they what they have to do is they have to anticipate and so on they come up with programs and they ask for participation in those but increasingly the calls coming from them are open you know come with a, to us with a good idea and we'll see if we can help you with your good idea so that's a fundamental change in the way we're looking at getting to space. And for me, that would be really exciting for you, whether you want to build a spacecraft or you're looking for the application that space can help with. 
if you want to build satellites and protect the earth, then if you can come up with smaller satellites, then they're, they're cheaper to put up, so they use less energy. They're more environmentally friendly because they use less bad materials, let's say. And less materials mean that when they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, they cause less of a problem. So there's a move towards effectively trying to understand satellites that we put in low Earth orbit, which aren't going to affect our environment. Unfortunately, this isn't always the case, and there's a lot of space junk up in space at the moment. So it might be that you have a passion for cleaning up space and you want to uh, try to figure a way where you can develop new technologies, new satellites uh, to do that. And uh, there's lots of different ideas from vaporizing some of these pieces of debris to taking them in a net and bringing them and burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. There are over half a million pieces of known debris that are tracked in space. They go from some things the, the size of a grain of sand right through to, to, to some centimetres and some pieces that are larger than that. And they can be devastating. We we've already heard about the International Space Station. Roughly three times a year, that has to be moved in order to uh, manoeuvre around pieces of debris that look like they might pose a threat. And we do know that there's already been a number of satellites which have actually been knocked out um, of operation uh, in a way which we don't fully understand and which has been attributed to being hit by pieces of debris. So just like we have to worry about trash on the earth, we have to worry about trash in space. But we don't want to let all of those problems say to us, well, let's not use space. So we've seen a lot recently with the, um, some of you may have seen the Starlink um, uh, suite of a constellation of satellites talk about it in the news. If you're not familiar with it, it's a company called SpaceX and they have a plans to put up many thousands of these satellites. And at the moment, many of them are visible in the night sky. That's not a problem if there's 10 or 12 or 20 or 30 maybe. But once you start getting to the thousands, the question is, what, can, can, is that something that we find acceptable? Do we want our night sky to be crisscrossed by low Earth orbit satellites? So you can, you can say no, and we, and we stop that. Or you can say, well, hold on a minute. What I want to do is I want to make those satellites invisible from the ground. And people will say to you, well, hold on a minute. You can't do that. To which a good technologist or a good physicist or a good chemist will say, well, can you show me the law of physics that says fundamentally that that's not possible? Because if you can, I'll accept it. But if you can't, then I'm going to see if I can make a satellite that's completely black. Now, suppose you're a business person. You're thinking, hold on a minute. There's all of these satellites, they're going to connect the globe, they're going to be really important. So if I can make them black, that's a huge business opportunity for me. So there are so many different ways of looking about careers that are related to space that we didn't have previously. If you're interested in understanding the climate, of course, we know that the fundamental issue with our climate really is that we're trapping too much of the heat that we receive from the sun. And in a way, it's as simple or as complicated. But the implications are devastating. And again, James talked about fires, rising sea levels, and we've seen these extreme weather events, which are, if you're my age, were very uncommon. For most of you, you're probably thinking it's a bit irritating, but this is the way the Earth is. But actually, it isn't the way the Earth always has been. So if we want to understand climate, which is the long-term uh, variations, then satellites really help us. So weather is the day-to-day -day stuff. That's really important because a flash flood can be devastating but climate is things that go on over millennia potentially and if we're trying to understand hundreds of years or into the thousands of years then we can see how the earth as a global system operates and more and more the data from satellites is available it's free and a lot of people have no idea what to make of it we're challenged with the amount of data coming back so it's a real opportunity if you're a computer but who wants to use maybe artificial intelligence or something to look at how you can help people to understand the nuances of what's affecting the climate change and then say, well, actually, if we did this here, we did that there. And, and again, James talked about some of these things, then we can actually help to be part of the global effort to reduce climate change, slow it down. And if you slow problems down, it gives you a chance to react. So rather than say, let's throw our hands up in the air, let's not, let's slow things down and give ourselves time to understand and work together to come up with an ultimate solution associated with climate change. And satellites are going to play an increasingly important role. Hannah mentioned about um, asteroids and the, 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 um, the various missions that are going to look at those. 
This is a quote from Stephen Hawking. The long-term survival of the human race is at risk as long as it's confined to a single. Sooner or later, disasters such as an asteroid collision or nuclear war could wipe us all out. And Neve is in front of this now, so I'll just move you there, Neve. But once we spread into space and establish independent communities, our future should be safe. Now, let's not be concerned that we're all going to die anytime soon. In fact, despite everything, it's still going to take some some time for for our planet to, to to really become in a catastrophic situation, and we have time to reverse it if we work together. Collisions with asteroids, we're getting better at, at, at doing something about that, and, and Hannah mentioned that. Uh, if they're very big, it's still going to be a problem. So if we really want to consider how we're going to survive in the long term, a million years' time. Now, that may be of no interest to any of us directly now, but a million years' time will come. I mean, the Earth is 4,500 million years old. So there's been lots of millions of years already in our history. Hopefully, there'll be lots more to come. Sooner or later, going to space makes sense. At the moment, we're trying to figure that out. And so, coming towards the end of my talk, the back to the moon is the first step in us really trying to understand. I'm going to show you a short video. But one of the key things about this is, unlike when we went to the moon the first time, now we go back to stay. And that is a fundamental change in the way we think about who we need to help us to get there compared to who we did before. And in case I forget, people like Neve, who have an artistic as well as a technical background, and, people, and who understands how people work in extreme environments, I know you're going to talk a bit about this in, in, in a short time, Neve, are critical to us understanding how to put people effectively in lunar lockdown for long periods of time. So um, here's a, a brief video. Going to put a bit of volume on that, Niall. Can you hear it at all? Yeah, it's just really low. Thanks. Yeah. It's sound is actually pretty poor, guys. I can't make anything out of it. Sorry. Okay, if we can't hear it, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that slide because um, I know we're time anyway. So effectively what that was talking about, um, so I'm just going on to the next slide, so apologies for the jump there for, for everyone watching. So what that, what that particular commentary was talking about was the, uh, uh, a, 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 um, a plan by the European Space Agency, which is evolving and in, in which the likes of James has been centrally involved, and a, a number of Irish um, uh, uh, engineers and scientists are involved in it as well. And what it is, is to go back to the moon uh, for, for a permanent habitation, to use the moon as a, as a source of mining materials, as has been mentioned previously, to use the moon as a means of observing out into the, into the universe. So to put a large radio telescope or optical telescopes on the, the far side of the moon, the radio in particular, because it, it, it's shielded from the radio interferences that now we have uh, across the, the, the Earth. And so the idea is that to, to go back to that, but that's such a large project or series of projects that it is like the International Space Station, it'll require us working to together in a global effort. So if we then come to to towards the, the end, and, and, and obviously me saying that isn't probably as impactful as it is when it's on, on the video, and apologies for that. But if we, if we talk about then just to finish the, the sustainable development goals, in each of the slides, um, there is a connection between the sustainable development goal, for example, eradicating poverty, uh, water for all, um, new types of manufacturing, and many of you will be familiar with these 17 sustainable development goals. Well, there is an effort on at the moment to have an 18th called the space economy, recognizing at the mo at that, that, that space now is part of what and who we are and it's part of our sustainability and our potential to be sustainable on this planet. And it's being discussed in various forums. In fact, it's being discussed next week at a UN uh, meeting, which is really exciting to see because what it's doing is it's recognizing fundamentally that space is no longer disconnected 
from our daily lives, as well as being something which is an exciting space, a place, a place to inspire, to enthuse, but it's also a place with increasing impact. And our lives are going to be bettered for it if we continue to connect into it. So whatever you think of doing with your career, don't ignore the potential for space to help you in that. So we ex support existing sustainable development goals and the overall conclusion from, from, um, from, from my brief presentation is this. Space provides a vast array of opportunities for all career paths. So if you're not interested in space, don't think space is not for me. Space can help us to continue because it has been doing this for years, maybe more in the background than we would like it to be, but to continue to improve the lives of people on there. And in the words of Space Week, this really is our planet. It is our space. It's nobody else's. There's nobody else in this vicinity other than us humans. And this is our time to take advantage of what we know about our planet and our space and make for a better life for all. And that's really an important message, I hope, that you can take away and be excited about going forward. So I, I leave with that and apologies for the sound on the video. That's great. Thanks, Niall. That's really great reflection. And, uh, you know, um, it's lovely that the space sector is aligning more and more with those sustainable development goals, you know, and that there are opportunities for us to do good with space more and more using the technologies that are out there and applying them back to our planet and further beyond. So um, thanks for sharing that. That was that was really great. So um, I'm going to call on Alan again because now you're going to continue the conversation a little bit more with with the people in the group that are dedicated to um, chat with you further and answer uh, questions um, for them. And, um, and also don't forget at the end, we have a panel session where uh, there is a prize for best question. Your school will get the telescope, which is always sponsored by KTEC. Thank you very much, KTEC. And it's time for the next quiz as well. So uh, Rob, our communications manager at Blackrock Castle um, Observatory, um, what are the deets? All right, so they're in the chat again. You just click the link, copy and paste the number. That's what you're gonna to need to participate in the game and it's gonna automatically generate a user ID for you. So that should take about two to three minutes and then we'll be bringing you right back to the main room again. Thanks so. Rob. And, um, and then there are teams then of people that are going to join Niall now in the breakout room as well. And that'll automatically happen. Brilliant, yes. okay. Yes. so we. We'll do that for a few minutes. And then um, next up then, you have me speaking about some of my experiences. But um, while we wait for you now to go into the breakout room. So it's really, I think it's great that we are really kind of, oh, Niall's gone. So Niall's gone. gone. So that you. <laughs> you're gone, you're gone to your breakout room. Listen, have a great session and enjoy your chat with, uh, with Niall. So um, I'll give you another second or two to do that quiz, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna start speaking. Hannah, how did you get on in your breakout room? It was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. You had such great questions, uh, really yeah. good questions. Ones that will definitely help, like asking like like what uh, subjects helped me uh, to get where I am. Why did I even decide to get into this area? Like how did I end up here? Brilliant. In this area of uh, space. And uh, even ones like, has it helped you understand the meaning of life and like oh. humanity's place in it, which is a brilliant question. I think it was very good. It was very good. Great, so you enjoyed it. It's brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant, Hannah, that's fantastic. Um, okay, I'm gonna start because I'm conscious of time and I'm going to share my screen. So let me just, before I do that, let me just line up my, I don't have many slides, but I'm a visual person, so. I find that uh, visuals kind of work for me. So now wait, now let me go back out of here and share my screen. Two seconds, share screen. Yeah, there it is there. Brilliant. I love this quote. So to me, this is kind of gets me up every day, this quote here, because uh, curiosity has been a massive part of me making the right choices in my life. And so I came to space very late in life um, because I, I actually 
didn't really think that someone like me could possibly be a part of space. And I know, you know, Stephanie was saying, oh, you have two degrees in engineering and a PhD in science. I'm a hard worker. I'm a grafter. But my real passion has always been space and and communicating with, with people. And so I love this quote from Mae Jemison. So she was the first black astronaut uh, for NASA. Um, but not only that, she's very wise because she understood that creativity and curiosity and logical brains are all one and the same. So since I've kind of figured out that I I'm, I'm some sort of person that I just love connecting with people, I love communicating with people, and particularly about space and science. And like what Niall was saying, space for good, um, that's kind of what gets me up in the morning. And so everything I do is rooted in that. I was the artist in residence at Blackrock Castle Observatory for five years. And in that time, we made two theatre shows together and I made visual art and um, I wrote about it and you know, I still write about it. And thank Stephanie for the plug for the book. The, I even wrote a book about it. And it's all about this image here, which is my obsession with seeing the earth from a distance. And it started out as sort of an artistic thing to go, wouldn't it be mad? if you said to the world that you would love to um, go to space. And um, I wrote a play about it and I thought that would be the end of it. But what started happening was, is that people from the space sector really understood the value of a creative mind and, and a writer being able to describe some of the feelings and some of the people involved in space. And so that, so that's, it's kind of become that. And, and it's sort of become this artistic goal as well of a, as, as well as a goal of like, well, maybe if I work hard enough as a communicator, when the time is right, when we're ready to send a communicator in space, I, I want to be on that list. And that's that's the goal. So everything I do is, is about that. So I'm going to talk to you today and everything is about the, the Earthrise, which Niall told you about today. So there's no point going on about that. So I want to tell you about some of the things that um, I have been involved in and one in particular. And it's and it kind of is matching what Jane was, was talking about and what, what Niall was talking about and, and Hannah as well, because it's all about space. But that's about... Um, analogs or um, analogs are facilities around the world that allow scientists and engineers and thinkers to consider how humans are going to live in extreme environments off Earth. So whether that's on the moon or whether that's on Mars, we just have to practice, practice, practice in order to make sure that when the day comes, when we have uh, these homes or these habitats built on these remote planets and, and celestial objects, that they're safe and that they work and that we've figured out everything we could possibly want to figure out. And that always starts with um, scientists and engineers and um, thinkers sitting down and figuring things out. And so um, I was invited uh, in my capacity as being a writer and a communicator and, and with this logical brain to join a crew back in uh, January 2017 to here. This is Utah and it's the desert in Utah. It's stunning. Hundreds and hundreds of miles of nothing, nothing. Like you could just drive for hours and you wouldn't see a soul. So a facility has been established there by the Mars Society, which is a society of scientists and engineers, everybody that, are, that don't necessarily work in space agencies that are just really interested in Mars and putting people on Mars. So the Mars Society, built a facility there, which was funded partly by Elon Musk back in the day in uh, 2002, if I'm correct, as well as the local, a local, a local union division in, in the region. And they built this. This is the Mars Desert Research Facility, and it's nested among the hills of a part of the desert which uh, resembles Mars. So a lot of the geology, which is the rocks and the formation of the rocks, they believe to be very similar to Mars. And that's why it's been it's been there. It's about 20 years old now at this stage. So it's kind of, um, everything's broken. Lots of things don't work. And I think that that's more of an authentic experience. If you were to live on Mars, that's kind of the way it would be because you can't ring up a plumber. You can't ring up, ring up an electrician. You just have to, you know, you just have to go with the flow. So, um, what happens is, is that you apply to the Mars Desert Research Station, you have a number of experiments, they if they like the experiments, your your mission goes ahead. And they also insist that there has to be some sort of outreach or communications activity. So that was my responsibility. And I wanted to tell the real story of what it's like to live on those uh, research stations. Sometimes the science gets a lot of focus and people talk about the results, but they don't really talk about what it's like day to day. 
And I'm always trying to connect with people who feel that science and space is kind of something beyond their area of expertise. So by humanizing these topics and, and bringing back the day-to-day -day activities of what it would be like to live there, um, that's what I wanted to focus on. So these were my crewmates. Uh, we were a crew of five. Uh, it was Roy from Israel, he's a geologist, then Michaela from Slovakia. She's an astrobiologist, very well respected in her field. And then the tall man at the back is from Australia. He's Rick, and he's also an astrobiologist. And then the man beside me is Idris, from um, originally from Morocco, but um, French. And he is an engineer and an entrepreneur. And then there was me. And the reason why we're wearing those blue suits and wearing and fashioning kind of homemade helmets is that because it's an analog and a simulated mission, you then uh, behave as if you're on Mars from the moment that your simulation begins. So you can't breathe if you stepped out of your habitat on Mars. So you would have to wear a spacesuit. So this was just a nod to a spacesuit. And it took ages to suit up, even just for that alone. So we spent 15 days there or sols, because when you're on Mars, a day, uh, the length of a day on Mars is slightly less than a day on Earth. So you call it a sol. And uh, we were there to conduct experiments and, um, and I was there to kind of catalogue the whole thing. Part of cataloguing this, this was a film that I just took of myself walking up towards the habitat because it's a great way to describe the facility. So you see a kind of around circular building. That is where we lived. So we had our living quarters up on the top floor and on the ground floor, we would have our airlock, which is a two way door system, which you would need on Mars, because otherwise, if you just had one door, every time you'd open the door, all your oxygen would fly out the door. And it was also where you had the engineering and the maintenance section as well. Now, because you're simulating life on Mars, you go in with a ration of water, a ration of food, and a ration of broadband, very, very, very small amount of broadband just for you to communicate with mission control and to request when you want to go outside on a spacewalk, which um, in the biz is called EVA or extravehicular activity. Uh, you see beside the roundy building, there is a greenhouse and it is a greenhouse really, but it's called a green hab because now you're simulating um, life on Mars. So it's a green habitat. And then the tunnels there, you see the white pieces that are covered over, that leads to the science dome and the observatory. And they were the only parts of the facility that we could go outside where we didn't have to suit up. So it was assumed that you were kind of still working in a tunnel that was underground because it took so long to suit up. The vehicles and um, the small vehicles, you see the ATVs and the electric cars up near the door of the airlock, we would use those to go around the region to collect geology samples. So you would put a map out, you would tell a mission control you want to go the next day, they would give you the all clear, then you would suit up and you would go out. And every time you go out, you'd be out for about four hours. And you would always have to have at least two people stay behind because you're on constant radio because it's dangerous once you go outside. Those suits are extremely heavy and, and cumbersome. The, the van, you see, you don't use. You only use that to come in and to go out. So um, after the previous crew left, you park that there and then you just kind of stay there for the duration. And it's there in case of emergency. And thankfully, we didn't have any emergencies. This is the upper section of that roundy building that I was telling you about. So you see, it's kind of dingy and, you know, a bit dirty looking. And I kind of liked that. It was impossible to keep the place clean because you have this red dust coming in all the time. And whenever it rained, it would turn into sludge. Your boots would be just covered in this red muck. This was our sleeping quarters. Um, very much like a kind of a, a, a bunk on a ship or something. And uh, no window because you wouldn't have windows on Mars because it would be a threat to a depressurization. So um, I brought just two pairs of trousers and four tops at me and just computer gear and anything I needed, any equipment I needed for the mission. That ladder up there is to the water tank. So you would then pump water from outside to that water tank and that water tank would then feed the watering system for the kitchen, for the toilet and for the greenhouse. And it would go uh, 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 every time you used it. So the water pressure was really low. This is what we ate. This is typical of what people would eat on any extreme uh, mission. So whether that's to the Antarctic or Everest or, um, you know, some food like that is, is taken to oil rigs or whatever. And it's just you add water to everything. It's that's dried egg. We had dried butter, dried milk, dried broccoli, dried cabbage, everything, you name it. And um, we had it dried. 
and um and the water uh, situation was so scarce that we didn't flush the toilet for number ones just for number twos and the toilet blocked for the first four days that was delicious and um showering i we had one shower in the middle of the of the program it, i wished i hadn't because it's that thing where you just feel really cold and miserable and the room was the bathroom is filthy so it's like ugh, you know uh, uh, in a way you didn't need to but it made me realize how smelly we were because people were like smelled amazing after they had that one shower but we were filthy by the end of it again this is when it kind of started feeling like something very different other than just a bad caravan holiday where you can't go outside in the rain with your family and you want to kill each other and you've run out of decent food um this is when you would suit up and again this is all homemade kind of stuff so the the helmet isn't a real helmet but it's just a, a nod to it so it's like a stainless steel kind of ca um like a collar that then kind of is attached to the helmet and the collar is made there's no kind of um chamfering or kind of smoothing off the edges so it kind of really cuts into your shoulder and then you put a kind of an oxygen pack on your on your shoulders as well it doesn't have oxygen because obviously earth has oxygen but what it does is it's supposed to circulate fresh air in your helmet so that it doesn't fog up and this is about as efficient as that is in other words it doesn't work a lot of them don't work and they're scratchy the helmets as well so your visibility was actually quite poor you had this really heavy rucksack for air filter thing on the helmet's really heavy the way the helmet's built you kind of have to crane your neck forward so you'd be wrecked uh walking around with it and also you had um all your hands and and feet and everything were completely you know suited up as well so you had no exposure to the elements so you felt very cut off and i had loads of camera gear as well and like we'd go and get samples up hills and everything so your center of gravity is off so you had to really be careful how you walked and then on top of that you're driving these atvs to get you to the next um to get you the, to the next uh, stop so um, everything was um, outside of my comfort zone completely. That piece of footage now is where it's nice and flat. And I have my um, SLR camera here, which is a digital camera. But most of the time you're going over kind of really hard rocks and you're communicating with each other through radio. And so if you're in front, your job is to keep looking behind that the other two people are behind you. If you're in the middle, you look behind. And then if you're at the back, it's your job to keep up with everybody because um, you can't really kind of lose sight of each other because if something happens, it's really down to your crewmates to kind of help you in those situations. Now, um, you, it, it, even just sitting on that is hard because you're kind of sitting forward in the suit and you can't sit back because you have this pack in your back and um, and the visibility isn't great. It's still foggy, but like, so that looks good because that footage is from outside of the actual, um, of the actual suit itself. And, um, and, you know, previous crews, some have been helicoptered out because they've broken bones or whatever, because they've had a bad fall in one of these um, ATVs. So even that alone um, makes it difficult. And then uh, when you actually uh, do get to the site that's decided on, you then uh, go and get geological samples up these hills. And um, I'm not great with heights. I've certainly overcome um, a lot of it from this mission, but you see how kind of gently I tread. And it's because you just, everything feels different and it takes a long time to kind of get your bearings in what you do. And the mission was uh, really interesting for me because um, I'm not uh, somebody that would have been a girl guide or done a lot of camping and stuff. So um, it was kind of a, a challenge for me, uh, just even as a person to put myself in that kind of position where everything is new, like the geologists and the astrobiologists, they're in the field all the time and they're well used to kind of taking samples in the field. This was all new to me. Um, every single moment of our mission was just eaten up with with different things happening all the time. There was no end of um, there was just no end of of the things that we had to do. We we just kept it just kept all the time. It just kept going and going and going. And um, the thing was that um, you would start the day and you would go, oh great, I've got you know we're getting up at seven. We'd have a meeting about what we had to do for the day, what experiments we had to run. And every single day it would go off 
um, you, you go off schedule because something would be broken that you'd have to fix. Everything took way longer. And then uh, because I was involved in the communications, people would have GoPros on their heads and they'd be taking pictures and they'd give them to me. And I would have to download the cards, the SD cards. I'd have to recharge all the cameras. Um, from um, seven o'clock to nine o'clock, we had to give mission control reports every day. It was nonstop. So nine o'clock you'd finish, but then I would always, I really wanted to keep communicating with Facebook. So then I had a ton of pictures and things to share. And um, it, it, it was just nonstop. And then with the water shortage as well, my room was heated with this gas heater. So I'd wake up every morning with a banging headache. And, um, and there's nothing you could do about it. You just had to just sort of deal with it. And when we finished, what I found really interesting was we bonded really well as a crew. But what was really interesting was that um, the last day came and the next crew came in and we had a tremendous sense of territory over the, the habitat, this dingy place, it kind of became our home. And it was weird seeing them in our kitchen, you know, but, but that's what it is, you hand it over. And we headed off, and we went to the nearest town, which is tiny, it's like one street, and we went for breakfast in Brenda's diner. And I ordered pancakes and coffee, it was amazing, because I hadn't had anything like that, in that in just 15 days, everything had changed. And so we decided we'd spend the day in another national park, because the whole area is like that. And some of them are open to the public. And so I said, yeah, I'll just go to the loo just before we get back in the Jeep. So I went to the loo. And of course, you know, for 15 days, we'd only been flushing the toilet for number two. So I leave the cubicle and then I went, oh, yeah, I better flush the toilet. So I went to flush the toilet and I couldn't get over how much water was like bursting through. I thought I'd broken the I thought I'd broken the cistern or something because it was like shh, shh, shh. Compared to this, like, uh, 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 like this, like squirts of water. And that was the sum total of the pressure of the pump. And then similarly, when I went to put my hands under the sink, um, I pressed the tap and it was like, Psh! I was like, ah! I couldn't turn it off because I was used to washing my hands with like, uh, 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 you know, and like, you know, catching your hands. And similarly, when you were brushing your teeth or cleaning yourself every day. And I never forgot it. And um, we jumped back in the Jeep and we went off to the National Park. And then I remember we got out again to take pictures and we got back in again. And I was like, <laughs> we stank. We absolutely stank. But I didn't smell it until I was back on earth for a while, if you know what I mean. I hadn't been outside in fresh air. <sighs> we really stank. So we went to it. We were stayed in this kind of motel and I went and had a shower and I showered for 20 minutes. In the first five minutes, the water was just like brown. I was filthy, filthy from head to toe. And then uh, I left them all. I was so lonely leaving them because we had become so close and we kind of developed loads of shorthand and stuff. And I came home and I was really looking forward to getting home and, you know, hearing birds again. I hadn't heard birds or dogs. I didn't see any animals or any wildlife. And I opened my apartment door and I was, I couldn't get over how big my place was. And I was really embarrassed that I had like 12 towels and like, five duvet sets and I had like glasses and trinkets and and it just all seemed ridiculous to me that I had all this stuff because I'd survived for just 15 days without a tv without internet without anything and I didn't miss a thing and it made me realize I don't need these objects and so you know I've been slowly kind of giving things away and apart from buying ESA t-shirts in the space shop merch um, I pretty much buy all my clothes now in secondhand stores and consignment shops because I, I just don't I, I really don't want to add to more stuff you know and that was the thing I learned and the teamwork and the trust that you have to build in crews in order to in order to be able to survive in extreme conditions so what I learned from it was that there's huge yes. benefits in telling a story that way and sharing it um, with uh, people outside of the space and science sector. So I share those slides and videos with schools, with families. And what's great about them is, is that initially it feels like just a kind of a funny story. But what happens is that people can kind of work out how does your water system work or how did your electricity work or how does and suddenly you're onto science and so it's a great way to break down any barriers that people have about science and engineering and tech stuff and because they really everybody is kind of nosy and they go how did your water pump work and you know you tell them and then they start asking questions about mars and then they start asking you questions about the solar system and suddenly boom you're into the whole thing 
So I don't know how I'm doing on time. Has Niall come back? Um, so apologies, interrupt. maybe a couple of minutes or possibly over time. We're over time and school is leaving. Yeah, okay. I'm going to finish now. And um, because yeah, we are over time. Bring back, Neil, so. Thank you. They're not back yet, are they not, Alan? No, I'm just bringing them back now. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, so that's me. That's my story. Anyway, if you have any questions, we have the Q&A session coming up, um, I think. But first, uh, we're going to watch an ESA video. Is that, are we still doing that, Al, or are we going straight to questions? Uh, no, we'll go straight to Q&A. Yeah, we'll go straight to Q&A because it is, it is getting late and uh, time ticks on, as they say. So what we're going to have is, you're very lucky, uh, we are now going to bring back our speakers from this morning, which were uh, James. We had James Carpenter at the top of the session and James works at the European Space Agency Exploration Science Coordinator and direct and, and also works in the Directorate of Human and uh, Robotic Explorations. And then we had Hannah and Hannah is coming from Inner Labs and she's a space reliability engineer. And then we had Niall, Niall Smith and Niall Smith, as we said, is um, director and co-founder and founder of the Black Rock Castle Observatory. And he's head of research at um, uh, Cork Institute of Technology. So Niall isn't back yet, but I guess it's time uh, to tell you that uh, at this stage, oh no, it's just back, perfect timing now. At this stage, um, what we want you to know is that there is a prize for the best question. And uh, KTEC, um, who provide telescopes, uh, have very kindly um, provided a telescope for the winning question. And your school will obtain that telescope. And it's a really nice telescope. KTEC do great telescopes. So, um, Let's see what kind of questions you have. So if you want to put them in the chat, and I think as well as that, Stephanie, have you been watching the, the any questions that have come through from the YouTube channel? Stephanie's still on. I think she's there somewhere, is she? There, there are actually loads on the YouTube channel, but I think it's Danielle is, is managing those. Danielle, are you yes, managing I've, so. I've got some questions here. Do you want to start with uh, some of the YouTube? Yeah, please. And let's see if any questions come into the chat. Yeah, Danielle, if you wouldn't mind, that would be really super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, we've got we've got so many great questions in here. So I'm going to pick some of the ones that are more specific to speakers. <coughs> I have one from uh, Leo uh, Liam, who says in the video um, from Isa, you Isa shows methods of removing space debris. So you, do you expect this as a problem? Uh, that this will be a problem that we'll be having to solve in the coming decades, or will it worsen due to increased space activity? So this will be more general towards towards everyone. Or maybe towards Niall, because you're more well, of the- I was going to say, uh, for the, the hesitation is, I think it was in James and mine or, or whatever, or certainly. So well, look, I, I'll open very quickly. Yes, it's going to become a bigger problem. Uh, at the minute, there's a number of reasons why. When we put, um, when we put uh, things into low Earth orbit, uh, at the moment, uh, we have to use vehicles that do that. And um, some parts of those do return to Earth rapidly and some, some don't. Some satellites, as we put more, and so that leads them then as debris. As we put more satellites, some will will fail, uh, some will be maybe we will lose control of, and they may degrade over time. And um, but we're also seeing as as new, um, um, as new entities put things into space and they learn how to do that, but sometimes they make mistakes and they leave debris behind. And um, there's a whole bunch of reasons why th that is going to increase. The, the, one issue, and um, by the way, on that very quickly is that when, as we put up many more, um, many more spacecraft, it's a bit like air traffic control. There are preferred routes that people would like to be in, so people want to be very close to the preferred routes for all sorts of reasons, um, and that 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 can create problems of, of collisions. And that's actually been looked at in some detail by the the star by the SpaceX guys because they want to put up the twelve and a half thousand satellites within within another four years. So, so, the, so the, it, it's, it is, it is like, it, it seems difficult. It's, it's growing at one, one final, final point. The other issue is that it actually is it, debris begets debris. So debris crashes into debris and causes more debris and very small things in space are very bad. And as we move to smaller satellites, very small things that admittedly it's a smaller target to hit, but they become more vulnerable to a single hit. Whereas a larger object like the International Space Station can take more individual hits. Very good. So Niall, since I, sorry, Steve, um, but since I have you, I, I do have one specific question for you. So, and then I'll ask James. 
Um, this is from Hassan. So hi, Niall, do you think space um, can help fight poverty by bringing the internet and hence information to poorer areas through satellite systems like Starlink? Yeah, so, so we, we had, we had a, a bit of a chat about this in the breakout. And I think that for me, the answer is, is absolutely. I think it's one of the, should be one of the objectives. It's one of the things that's discussed in various fora, in, in particular about the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how space can immediately support that. The, the biggest, one of the biggest issues we have on the planet is access to education. It's shown time and time again that if you don't understand things, you feel intimidated, you feel disconnected, you attempt to achieve less, you believe your lot is to have less. Education helps us to be more confident, it helps us to drive on, uh, and, and, and what we don't want to do is, is have a situation where that gets more polarized. So I think they have a role in it. They won't solve it all on their own. But in the at, right at the minute, there is a way of providing a, a, a low bandwidth internet widely. And also what is shown is the key difference between no internet and low band internet is much more significant than between low band internet and large band internet. If you're disconnected, that's the real problem. So bringing low bandwidth uh, um, is, is what we should be looking at. And we worry about the gaming in, in 10K or whatever it is going forward subsequently. James, I think maybe there was a... So um, basically everything Niall just said. Um, the, I think that the space debris, space debris um, is a growing problem. It's something we've known was coming. Um, if you look at the number of launches, the number of vehicles that are in space now, you look at the collisions that happen, um, so debris can move from very large objects like Envisat, huge European spacecraft, which stopped working um, some years ago, and now he's going round and round, and will continue doing that for a very long time, unless someone moves it, down to these very small spacecraft, leading down to very, very small pieces of debris. So bear in mind, these, these tiny particles are moving at, at kilometers per second. They're like bullets. Um, and if one of those hits you, even if it's tiny, it can make a huge amount of damage. So um, as the, the amount increases, also as the, the cost goes down and to get to orbit and, and more smaller spacecraft being launched, the failure rate for these spacecraft is much higher than it would be for these very large things that, that people spend a lot more time and money making sure that they work. So there's going to be more of these uh, sort of failed spacecraft floating around. And so um, finding ways to remo actively remove debris from orbit is going to be something which is increasingly important. As we want to use space more, the space to use gets less, and so we're going to have to make space. And James, I have a specifically for you from Taha. He says in your speech about uh, your idea in the future, you mentioned that most humans will likely be living in space. Um, so how would viruses and bacteria infections be managed? Okay, so firstly, this is, this is a possible future. Right? I think that at some point in the future, it's possible we'll have humans uh, living um, in space. And actually, one of the key things we need to understand, and actually, it's a superb question, because we often think about what does the space environment, uh, reduced gravity, and the radiation we experience in space, how does that affect human physiology? The human physiology doesn't work on its own. It works in partnership with a huge amount of much of microbiobial life that travels inside us and outside us and with us wherever we go. Um, and we also need to understand how the space environment will affect those, uh, my, how about those microbes that, that travel with us and live with us. Uh, and that's something else that's, that's not really very well understood today. Um, certainly the radiation environment, um, we, we live now in a radiation environment and one of the wonderful things is our biology and the biology around us is adapted to live in a radiation environment. So radiation causes damage to DNA and you can actually watch in these days, you can watch DNA repairing itself after being exposed to radiation damage, it's extraordinary. And one of the things that happens is when that repair process goes wrong, that can lead to things like cancers and tumours and issues like that. And so understanding that damage repair process is really fundamental. And so, um, but that happens not just in humans, but in other things too. And we need to understand how these, um, how that environment will affect things. So it will have an effect. Uh, also, when you take a microbial environment and you put it um, and you become self-contained, so it becomes a closed um, cycle, um, it also affects the way that it operates. So one of the things that we try to do on the ISS, for example, is to look at the microbial environment and to understand how that's changing and evolving over time and try to manage it. Uh, and actually, it, there's some very strange microbial things going on in the ISS, actually. 
Um, and now when we go to Gateway, we're moving into a different radiation environment further away from Earth, outside of the protective shield of our magnetosphere. And now one of the key things there to do will be to, to look at this microbial environment and watch how it evolves over time so we can understand this better. And that's going to be important to any long-term human activity in space, whether that's in the Gateway, whether that's on the surface of the Moon, humans to Mars, and eventually sort of larger scale human habitats. But um, it's a really good question. There's one here for Hannah, Danielle. Can I, can I ask it here in the chat? So it's, uh, yeah. Hannah, Hannah, would you think computer science as a leaving search subject would be a good idea for a career in space science? Or what would be the three best subjects apart from the applied maths you mentioned? And that's from Jack, and he's a TY student from St. Joseph's Bar Barisoli. Pretty good question. Um, I definitely think computer science is definitely a bonus. Like I know for me, when I went to school physics degree, I didn't realize physics was closed until like my second year. It was a big learning curve. Uh, but once you learn, I think getting your grasp on computer science is definitely one of those subjects. And um, in terms of maybe like technology, I know that there's um that you can do learn CAD and stuff like module or subjects like that definitely are a bonus or engineering. But it just depends obviously on what your school. Is giving you like I didn't have technology as an option when I was when I was going for my leaving cert, which I would have chosen. But it's um, instead I just decided on geography, chemistry, and physics, and applied maths. Sorry, Neve, you're muted. I muted there because Hannah. We all need to mute uh, when Hannah speaks because her. Her audio uh, picks up the number of speakers. So uh, I, um, I muted you, James and Niall there. So this is a good one. Do you think that the first trillionaire will make their money through mining asteroids? And that's from Ashton School. That's a great question, isn't it? What do we think there, guys? Throw it out there. What's, what's the answer? It's, it's been speculated. I, I've seen that often. Um, the key thing with, so asteroids have a lot of stuff that's really useful. So they contain a lot of water and water is like the oil of the solar system, right? So you can access water on an asteroid, you can make rocket fuel, you can go anywhere else. So there's masses of the stuff out there. Um, they also contain um, lots of metal. So there are asteroids that come from the centers of, of, of large asteroids that got smashed to pieces, which are basically pure iron and nickel with other things like platinum group metals and stuff in there. So um, there's a lot of useful stuff. The question is, is there a market? Is it economically viable for Earth somehow? Because in the end, People on the trillionaires are going to be making money on Earth for doing something that's useful for Earth. And so um, if somebody can find that magic, that, you know, that killer app, then uh, it's, not a, it's not impossible. So one example I've seen for it is that uh, maybe um, asteroids or the remnants of these metallic asteroids that you find in craters on the moon might be rich in um, platinum group metals. Mm. And those platinum group metals are something that's important for catalyzers, um, for catalysis reactions in fuel cells, um, which, and, if, and the cost of those is one of the limiting factors for what we call the hydrogen economy, using hydrogen as a way of storing and transporting fuel. And if you could bring these things from space to Earth, um, you could perhaps mass kill the cost of platinum. And by killing the cost of platinum, you could perhaps open up this, um, lower the cost of all these applications of platinum group metals. So there are these things which are non, not proven, but they're not impossible. Uh, and if somebody can find that killer app, then uh, then anything's possible. So, and know. just as a very brief follow on, um, the Luxembourg has placed a lot of its uh, uh, space uh, future uh, in terms of mining. So if you if you want to mine asteroids and you want to look for venture capital funding to try to develop some of these uh, approaches for this killer app that James is referring to, then actually Luxembourg is the place to go. And in a way, the, the, one simple way that it was, I, I noticed one venture capitalist said uh, was, well, you know, if, if it becomes more difficult to find, even though let's say, let's for say, take the platinum, loads of platinum on air, but it just becomes more and more difficult to find it because we've got the easy stuff at some point, Either because of volume or just how, how difficult it is to get it. it's it's actually it makes more sense to go with an asteroid so it's a really, i think it's a really interesting one and james answered very well but I, I wouldn't be surprised if a trillionaire maybe not the first but i think a trillionaire may come uh, or a com companies were trillions in today's things from from mining asteroids and um, one would like to think that we can actually figure a way around it but 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 um 
who knows? Who knows? It, I, I wouldn't put all my savings into into asteroid mining just just yet. It's, it's pretty speculative right now. But just to touch away on the, the, the Luxembourg the Luxembourg thing, this is a topic that's coming up increasingly. So a number of countries now are starting to put um, kudos on this. Luxembourg was one of the pioneers. And what that's interesting is in the 1970s, Luxembourg took a bet on satellite communications as a, as a major focus at a time when it was really, it was a bit out there. Uh, and now they have you know, a huge company um, in Luxembourg, one of the biggest telecoms providers in the world. Um, and now they've, they're basically doing something similar, saying, well, we think the next really big thing is going to be space resources, and they're putting their efforts into that. So I think it's I really say, exciting. By the way, J James, actually, depressingly, Ireland was given the option of placing that technology in Ireland, and a decision was made by the then government that there was no future in doing that. So <laughs> Ireland actively rejected the possibility to be uh, that, to, to do exactly what Luxembourg went on. So let's hope we don't keep on rejecting opportunities <laughs> into the future just because they're in space. Uh, I'm conscious of time. Uh, Danielle, I have another question here, an astronomy related one. Do you want me to ask this one or have you got another one over on YouTube? I've got a really fun, just general to everyone question, I think. Okay, uh, we better finish. more specific because you can do yeah. yours first and then I'll go. Okay, yeah, okay. So we'll quickly, we got this one, we got two left then. So one from the chat and one from here. I like this because it's astronomy. Where is it? Oh, where did it go? How can astronomers know certain information since they look at space from one vantage point? So Hannah and Niall and James, anything to? Yeah. It's a good. It's a good question because they're thinking. It's good. Yeah. No. Can, can I? Well, can I kick off? With just. I mean, I think one of the great achievements of the human brain is our ability to develop a self-consistent model. Doesn't mean it's perfect, by the way, but to develop over time a self-consistent model, uh, and largely we do it by. In fact, there's really only a couple of ways we do it. Most of what we've understood about the universe comes from electromagnetic radiation in the first instance. Now, some of it then comes, and which reaches the ground, actually, because a lot of it has been optical telescopes traditionally. Then we've gone up to space and we've broadened our, 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 our wavelength, range, but we're still electromagnetic. To, to an extent, of course, we've now gone with spacecraft and sample things and so on, so we've managed to move that. But, but because most stuff in the universe is very far away, and somebody else talked about the expanding universe there, I think it was an Ashton College question, and, and that's getting further away. So we actually, it's a really good example of lots of pieces of a puzzle that have to be put together. And then what, one of the things to be always aware about scientists is they love to knock each other. So when you put the puzzle together in one way, somebody wants to, instead of say, that's brilliant, you're great. They want to say, actually, I think you're together the wrong way but that advances the science but in, in the fundamental the question do we know that we're right no we don't we have more and more indications that we have more and more better model but there could be for example a fundamental change to the model one thing that is discussed when i was a kid never was now much more so just idea of a multiverse and the fact that we don't only live that there isn't just this one reality and there's indications as to why, that, why this actually gives us all sorts of problems at a fundamental physics level, if this is the full extent of the universe. But mm. fascinating has been part of putting the puzzle together for me. Sorry, that went on a bit longer. Than but Hannah, would you, have you got anything? Because I know you're passionate about all this. Um, no, it's, it's, I think uh, Niall definitely answered really well there. Um, yeah, when I was working in the area of astronomy, I realised how big the community is. So everyone is coming together and giving each other the information they're all gathering and it's released every day on new science papers and stuff so um it looks like one vantage point like one like astronomers are looking at one thing they're actually looking at everything and there's stuff in space talking the satellites in space talking to uh like uh observatories here on the ground and they communicate with each other it's it's amazing it's absolutely amazing like i think gravitational waves when they were detected that was a war I was mad that was actually magical like how that worked out detected it then they ended up like using their telescopes to find out where is it in the in the uh, in the universe and where is it in a galaxy over there and it's and in another galaxy like it was just it was amazing it was absolutely amazing uh, so big team in effort. astronomy everyone works together yeah big team effort Danielle what's your question I think this should be the last one and then our judges our panel has to deliberate on what yes Question. Absolutely. So this is open to everyone. And I really like this question. Is there any boring aspects of space? Well, um, I would say funding applications. 
<laughs> you know, because nothing happens without getting funding and yeah, but I mean, I think if you're involved in any sort of sector involving research, that's just not specific to space. So that's I would say art. leading funding applications. Oh, <laughs> try writing them, Stephanie. <laughs> Look, I, I think if everything you do in life that's worth doing has to have an element to it of routine or, yeah. or you know, you just, oh, not again, or it doesn't go the right way. So, yeah, I mean, definitely on a day-to-day -day basis, it's up and down. The fact that actually you're seeing a bunch of people here who are, well, uh, I'm going to, I, well, me certainly, definitely the oldest, but, you know, still enthusiastic tells that despite the ups and downs, I think it's the ups that keep you going and the next bit keeps you going. Oh no, there can be days when you think, oh, uh, you know, and you can feel like I just can't do this. I'm not smart enough or I haven't got that, whatever. There's all sorts of human emotions come in, in being involved in trying to push something forward. I, the first thing for me is everybody should do it. You don't have to be Albert Einstein. You don't have to be brilliant to be involved to make a contribution and really importantly to get something back you never know what what comes of a conversation you have so it really can enrich your life but no you will be bored you'll be frustrated you'll be annoyed at times and some people do it and change and that's fine too mm -hmm. so um the european space agency is a uh, a club of which we have 22 member states so that's 22 countries with 22 governments 22 different policies on space uh, 20 different ways of funding things and doing things and we have to try and herd the cats into a common program where everybody agrees to do something that's quite complicated there's a lot of bureaucracy involved in it and it can become quite frustrating and there are very boring aspects of that at the same time if you want to build a spacecraft at some point it has to become boring because what is the last thing you want is a spacecraft that's about to go to space and everyone's very excited whether it'll work or not Right? You do, you, at some point, you have to be just confident. It has to be boring by the time it goes. Otherwise, it's uh, that's, 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 that's a lot of money down the drain. Mm -hmm. so, um, so sometimes, I think Noel said it very well, sometimes at work you get quite, it can be quite boring or frustrating at times, or you really feel like, you know, why am I doing this? But why, every now and then, I, I have a moment where I realize what I do for a job, and my nine-year-old self says, shut up. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and then I, I just I was just ex how extraordinary it is to be doing what I'm doing and to be a part of something that is as wonderful as having 22 different countries working together in cooperation to do extraordinary things together and create a future. Um, I think that's wonderful, and and that can never be boring. Yeah. What about you, Hannah? Documentation, I'd say, yes, uh, it's constant. I actually just grabbed this. I'm like reading standards that the European States Agency need us to read up on. I, 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 my desk is beside a shelf of standards and I just have to turn around each day and grab them out, flick through them, a reference to them, documentation. And it's document heavy, I think, is the air. Like I love going in doing the bit statistics and going in and doing the experiments and then you realize, whole second I have to write up like a 40 page document 100 page document on on this what I've just done and uh yeah no I think that's probably the only area that is like it's like that dreaded moment but it's it's fun like once it's done you're actually very proud of the work yeah what about you Stephanie yeah, I think it's like every job, there, it, it has a lot of donkey work and then there's some amazing events. But um, I, I just think that the take home from today is these are opportunities that are available to all, all the students attending this event. They're not for the other students over there. They're, they're opportunities that are available to you. And I just think, Nave, wouldn't it be fantastic if one of the people in the room today in five or eight or 10 years time, if we're inviting them back to present at a, a future space careers workshop, whether it be during engineers week, space week or science week. Yeah. So really, I think that would be fantastic. That's a lovely end. So um, Danielle, how, how are we going to find out um, best question? How, how are we going to do this between our panel of speakers? How does this work? Stephanie, tell us, how are we going to do this? How are we going to pick? Oh, sorry, Rob. sorry about that. I Rob. hit the wrong button. Um, okay. Sorry, Rob, go ahead. Rob, take yeah. it away. 
Uh, the judging panel are going to be moved into a little room with me for just a minute. We're going to chat it through and we'll come right back to you. So, Niamh, uh, if you could yeah. pull down the port a little, here. A little song, Niamh, for a minute oh, or two. Oh, no problem, no problem. I yeah. think I have a nice video with you, Niall, in it, actually. Um, well, no, a little song from you. <laughs> I think, is this the one? Yeah, I do, I have this one. So I'm going to play a video. So this is the kind of stuff I do, guys. I'm going to share my screen. Lovely. We, uh, we could actually, if we have a few minutes, we could play that Issa yeah. video now, actually, Rob. Yeah. Issa which, sorry, Stephanie? Issa video. Oh, thanks that we didn't show earlier. One more time then, Stephanie, just because two people spoke. Sorry, the ESA projects video that um, we, we didn't show earlier. Uh, if somebody can get that up, great, but I'll be in the uh, breakout room, so I can't play that. So if somebody can find that and play that, that'd be great. Thank you. So what I might do, will I just play my video instead? Um, that's probably the easiest thing to do. I'm not gonna go into the breakout room because I'm gonna, I'm gonna just keep people entertained. So I get to talk to lots of really interesting people. It's the thing I love about my job. And very early on in 2014, when I started, I uh, interviewed just three people about what fascinated them about the universe. And I'm just going to share this video with you and we'll stop it if they come back early because I know everybody's stuck for time, but it's just... think it's uh, the numbers are, are just quite amazing uh, if you imagine you have something between 300 billion and 500 billion stars in a galaxy and 300 to 500 billion galaxies in the universe these are quite mind-numbing huge numbers anything really the fact that it seems it seems to obey laws is crazy it's seems to be finite in nature as well and just the whole where did it all come from it's just really a fundamental but and we can ask our questions and probe but we seem to only know how to get back to 10 to the minus 34 seconds after the big bang you may be just quarks and electrons let's say but it's the way you're put together the way they are put together is so unbelievably unique but compare yourself with the vast majority of the molecules or the quarks in the universe which basically are doing bugger and you're unbelievably unique it just seems crazy that there's uh, that you have sentient beings on that planet that a rather insignificant planet around an insignificant star in a unremarkable galaxy that we can ask quest that we can ask questions about what's the most important thing in the universe. It's just it's, it's, a, it's a head breaker. I, I think if, if you were to look in the most objective way, your existence and your ability to to be that consciousness of the universe is so astonishingly unlikely. It's such a privileged thing to be in the universe. Okay, so I think if we, um, if I just kind of go through uh, the last bit of housekeeping while we wait for people um, to come back, there are a lot of people behind um, this juggernaut of Space Careers Roadshow and, and Space Week itself. So firstly, um, big kudos to Blackrock Castle Observatory for running this and hosting it today and you know, I'm working with Azero Ireland and, and Stephanie to make it happen. So you have Alan Gilton, um, you have Danielle Wilcox, and you have Rob O'Sullivan and um, Francis McCarthy in Blackrock Castle Observatory. So, so they're also the coordinators for Space Week. So we have to thank them for all the work that they do. The Education and Resource Office is Aero Ireland, that Stephanie is the manager, has um, is the main funder of, um, of Space Week uh, through um, Science Foundation Ireland to Discover Programme. So none of that's possible without the, the, these funded um, projects available. 
And Stephanie is great. Like Stephanie absolutely champions um, space careers and she runs the Zero Ireland desk and all the competitions like CANSAT. And there are lots more different types of projects that are connected to the European Space Agency. All that information is up on the Azero website, which is azero.ie. And um, the last thing to do really is to kind of thank our speakers, which are, you know, we, we started out with Stephanie, who gave us an introduction, Stephanie O'Neill. Then we had James Carpenter from uh, the European Space Agency. And, um, and then we had Hannah Curavan from Inalabs. And then lastly, we had Niall, who's founder of um, Black Rock Castle Observatory and head of research at BCO or Black Rock Castle Observatory. And then you had me. So it's always brilliant um, to uh, run this roadshow and we do them regularly. And I hope that you, you get a, a good understanding of all the different careers that are available to you and you know, creative as well as logical, scientific engineering, but also uh, the humanities as well. There's needs for communicators, there's writers, lawyers, you know, governing different planets is going to be a big thing. Um, and coming up with law, space law. So there are there are opportunities for everybody um, if if you want them there. And um, and Space Week will run until the 10th of October. There's lots more activities going on. And if you check out the Space Week website, which is spaceweek.ie, you will find out. Um, so uh, yeah, you can run that video, uh, Alan, if you want now, because I've just given the thanks. So we'll just run this until everybody comes back and we find out who won the best question. You can't hear any volume yet, Alan. Spanish National Satellite Mission, funded by CPTI, the Spanish Center for the Development of Industrial Technology, developed by the European Space Agency in collaboration with Spanish industry. The mandate of CPTI uh, is uh, promoting uh, the innovation and uh, technological development of Spanish companies. Uh, we belong uh, to the Ministry of uh, Science and, and Innovation, and uh, we have a special mission to try to convert technological and scientific uh, knowledge to uh, competitive and sustainable growth uh, in Spain. Teosat Ingenio is an optical Earth observation satellite which will provide high resolution images of Earth's land cover with a primary focus on Europe and in particular Spain, North Africa and South America. Teosat Ingenio carries a state-of-the-art dual camera that can image Earth's land with a resolution of 2.5 meters. It will capture images in the panchromatic band, meaning black and white, as well as in four multispectral bands, red, blue, green, and near-infrared, at a resolution of 10 meters. The satellite will be covering swathes of land 55 kilometers wide, and also has the capability to look sideways, enabling it to access any point on Earth within three days challenging mission for engineers to develop. Optical payloads are uh, very challenging in terms of alignment and stability of uh, their elements. Uh, in mirrors and uh, optical elements of Zeosat have to be aligned with extremely high precision, equivalent to some one-tenth of the diameter of uh, human hair. And, uh, in spite of the very high vibration experienced by the satellite during launch and during the extremely uh, large temperature variation in orbit. The final test performed with uh, the satellite has proven that uh, the payload and the satellite comply with uh, this requirement and maintain very well their performance. Seosat Ingenio is aimed at civilian, institutional and government uses and will provide information for a wide variety of applications. These include disciplines such as cartography, agriculture, forestry, urban development and water management. 
The data will also be used to help map natural disasters, such as floods, wildfires, and earthquakes, as well as provide information on one of humankind's biggest challenges, climate change. The SEOSAT mission has been developed as part of the Spanish Earth Observation Program, which is based on two complementary satellites, Ingenio and PAS, which is a radar mission, but its scope goes beyond the national level. SEOSAT Ingenio first exhibits the European landscape of satellite missions that are existing or planned in the near future. For example, we have the Copernicus program with the Sentinel, which are uh, delivering data for free and open to everyone, but at a lower resolution. Uh, SEOSAT in Helio provides higher resolution at 2.5 meters in the panchromatic uh, channel, uh, and therefore complements the Copernicus data, but also is a commercial satellite where these data will be offered on the commercial market. So it is a commercial enterprise as much as a societal enterprise because information that is required is of value to Europe, uh, is of value to Spain, and is therefore also uh, filling a market segment that today is a very important one. Today, high resolution images of Earth are deemed an essential commodity for a wide range of scientific, commercial, and governmental applications. With the development and launch of CEOSAT Ingenio, ESA and Spain are answering these needs. Once again, ESA and Europe are proving that they are at the forefront of Earth observation technology, providing the data needed to monitor our planet while servicing and protecting the people living on it. Thanks, Al. I think everybody's back. So, Stephanie, I've given thanks. All that's left is to announce the winner. So you take us home. Yeah, great, need. Thanks. Thanks to everybody for joining us. Thanks, especially to our speakers for that, such passionate and interesting presentations. And um, thanks to you, Neve, because I doubt you thanked yourself. So thanks to you for, 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 for managing us for today. Sorry, we went a little bit over time, but I think we were a little bit late starting. So forgive us on that. Uh, in terms of the winner of the telescope, uh, the question came from Niall's breakout room. And it was whether we'll, it's more likely that we'll have a habitat on the moon or on Mars. And that question came from Kalosh de Kiron in Limerick. So congratulations. I hope you really make use of your telescope. Um, and the team in, in Black Rock Castle Observatory will be in touch to, to make sure to get a, that out to you. So thanks very much, everybody. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of Space Week. Don't forget spaceweek.ie for all the events. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Bye, everyone. Bye, Anna, Stephanie, Neil. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone.